I started out my academic career as an art historian with a major in Asian languages and uh, that uh, took me to Asia and sort of disillusioned me with uh, traditional spiritual uh, approaches uh, in the Asian style and I reconnected then with my uh, childhood love of nature and pretty much abandoned the humanities and went into the sciences but by then it was too late to become a real scientist and I was too tainted by my time again among the poets and the artists so I had to become a very soft hard scientist so I got a degree in conservation of natural resources, about as soft a science as you'll ever hope to touch. And uh, I did a lot of traveling around looking for a viable, vibrant, numinous approach to spiritual reality. And the only place I found it was uh, in the Amazon basin where, as you know, there are extremely archaic groups of people, people who never submitted themselves to the, the historical process the way uh, the peoples of the Middle East and Europe did. And there, there flourishes through the use of uh, chemically complex plants, uh, techniques and traditions for accessing uh, a world invisible to the rest of us, a world of forces and uh, information that is uh, transhuman, supernatural, if the word means anything. But this, um, this supernatural dimension is uh, anchored in the plants that live in our world and my brother was a botanist and I had botanical training as we studied the psychoactive plants of the world especially the new world tropics where they seem to be concentrated we were simultaneously exalted by the realization that we had found a doorway a real doorway into hyperspace and at the same time, tremendously uh, upset and, uh, and alarmed by the fact that this doorway is in the process of being dismantled by the forces of human ignorance that are not even aware of its existence. So uh, this was the impulse behind uh, the decision on the part of my partner, Kat, and I, that these plants must be saved. They must be preserved in germplasm repositories or botanical gardens or something like that uh, toward a day when they can uh, be studied and the uh, power, the dimensions within them can be given their real weight. So, to this end, we founded a botanical garden in Hawaii that is specifically dedicated to preserving plants with a history of uh, shamanic importance. And I mention this because this is the real world political work that we do. And everything else I will say today will be barely anchored in any world familiar to most of us. But there is a political anchoring. There is a place where it all comes tangential to the World Bank and the IMF and the host governments and so forth and so on. It is tremendously important to preserve this shamanic option if for no other reason than we do not know what it is. We do not know uh, uh, what it is. Well, um, so at the break, if you come up, the uh, newsletter of our botanical garden is the large stack of beige paper, and there are 300 copies of that, so I hope there's enough for, for everyone. 
Uh, we do s exist on uh, uh, donations, so any of, if any of you are philanthropists, uh, we can certainly tell you how to spend your money. We have many plans for your money. Okay. Um, I wasn't kidding about what an honor I think it is to address the Jung Society. At one point in my life, my greatest desire was to become a Jungian analyst. And I had the good fortune of coming upon Jung very young. I was about 15 when a very precocious friend of mine brought uh, Psychology and Alchemy in the Carrie F. Baines translation. I think it had just been brought out. And we were stunned and we read it from cover to cover and then went on to Mysterium Cunjunctiones, Ion, the studies in the phenomenology of the self. I said to someone yesterday, we read all the books of Jung that the Jungians never read. Uh, they seem to stop up there toward the front of the line with the archetypes of the collective unconscious and the personality type. But to my mind, it was the late stuff that was fascinating. And I am slightly puzzled, and we were talking about it last night, at the distance between the Jungian community and the psychedelic community because they seem to me, the unschooled observer, to be uh, definitely sharing the same concerns and strangely enough they share much of the same history and geography. Basel was of course Jung's hometown, it was Albert Hoffman's hometown. <laughs> Did one half of town know what the other half was doing? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Um, the, the relationship of Jung to the unconscious, uh, to the collective unconscious as its discoverer has been always somewhat puzzling to me because of course if you know the history of 20th century art, you know that Dada, which was the great prefigurative movement for surrealism, rose in Zurich. So, you know, we've got LSD, the uh, schools of modern art that laid great stress on the irrational and the great schools of psychology that extended the boundaries of the unconscious all rattling around in these little Swiss towns and uh, uh, it's interesting to imagine conversations or meetings that might have taken place uh, when people slightly left their ordinary habits and wandered into bars they didn't know and <laughs> drank with people they'd never met before. Uh, because Jung provided maps of the unconscious and at 16 when we were beginning to experiment with this and, and let me stress this was before the great social waves of LSD taking of the 1960 just preceding that from about 1963 uh, to 65, we were frantic for maps of the unconscious. And Freud was useless. I mean, the notion that the contents of the psychedelic experience could be reduced to what Freud called day residues and repressed sexual design stuff like didn't wash. Within 10 minutes, you could tell that was not a serviceable metaphor. <laughs> Jung, on the other hand, offered a vast uh, pantheon of uh, gods and archetypes and psychic complexes forgotten or abandoned. I mean, I thought of Jung basically as a no what I call a noetic archaeologist someone who goes with toothbrush and nut pick to dig away the detritus from the bones of vanished idea systems. And if any of you have ever read the complete, the works of Jung in the, in the Bollingen set, you know that the richness of it is all in the footnotes. I mean, here was a man who raised the footnote to a high art <laughs> and who was aware of a literature that nobody else to my mind, seem to know about. That Jung's references reach a thousand years deep into the past with great 
uh, uh, density of reference. I mean, this is where I learned about Macrobius and Docetheus and Dionysius, the pseudo Areopagite, and all those folks that you just never hear about. It was uh, my introduction to the under to the underbelly of Western uh, civilization uh, was through Jung. Well, uh, to my mind, and now I'll theme this in to today's theme. Uh, I think Maria mentioned that uh, Jung did not say, have a lot to say about shamanism. He came to it late in his life and he had already worked through the massive, the exegesis of the symbol systems of the European mind. And so he was sort of content to indicate shamanism as an area where more work was to be done. And then the great follow-on scholar was Merciliad, who then actually uh, studied shamanism, showed what its archetypal underpinnings were, in all times and places. And uh, the combination of Jung and Iliad, I think, pretty much delivered us as firm a map of the psyche, as dependable a map of the psychic geography as we can expect to have until we make the trip ourselves and uh, you know, readjust the landscape with our own notes and uh, observations. For, for Jung, the great path into the unconscious uh, was alchemy. And alchemy uh, is an interesting, pivotal uh, domain because I think we could, in a way, say it lies halfway between the concerns of an archaic shamanism and halfway between the concerns of a uh, quasi-scientific uh, psychedelic attempt to explore consciousness. Uh, Merciliad wrote a brilliant book on alchemy called The Forge and the Crucible, which is the bridge to show you how you go from Jungian psychology into an understanding of alchemy that approximates Iliad. The notion for the alchemists that Jung brought forth very strongly was the idea of projection of psychic contents, projection of the active imagination onto processes and uh, objects in the exterior world. In the case of the alchemists, it was the swirling chemical processes in their alembics, in their alchemical vessels, that they projected uh, the... Uh, the great round of the archetypes on to these chemical processes. They saw crystallization, sublimation, separation as statements about the contents of the psyche as much as statements about uh, the exterior world because for them the firm division between mind and matter the firm ontological division between mind and matter that is built into Western thinking now did not exist. That comes with René Descartes, with the invention of what's called the res extensa, the extended world, and the res verens, the interior world, which has no spatial extension. Uh, so for the alchemists, mind and matter were, th were two terms whose mutual exclusivity could be blurred under certain circumstances, and the terms of one could migrate toward the other. Well, now we as moderns ordinarily only experience this state when we are intoxicated by hallucinogenic drugs or when we are in a state of severe uh, psychic uh, weakness, when there is then overwhelmment from the unconscious that is not, uh, not with the permission of the ego as happens in the psychedelic experience. Well, all of these various ways of approaching the psyche uh, seem fairly abstract and bloodless and removed from daily existence unless the psychedelic experience is uh, 
present. And then it vivifies these metaphors. It makes clear what these various perennial traditions are uh, talking about. So what I thought I would try to do today, and you're welcome to try and steer it other directions in the question and answer period, is the, the workshop is sacred plants as guides. Uh, a lot of information has to be imparted if we're going to satisfy my pedagogical urge here. <laughs> because I would really like to leave you with information that you didn't have before, some of which may have practical efficacy in, in your own uh, life. So in thinking about this very large issue, sacred plants as guides, uh, I basically break it down into three categories for ease of handling uh, in a context like this. And they are a kind of survey. What, how many of these plants are there? What are the chemicals that drive them? And what is their geographical distribution? In other words, just what are the botanical facts of the matter? And then, uh, secondly, I think in order to understand what these things mean for spiritual growth and psychic development, you have to place them in a context. And the context is chronological and historical. Have these things always been around? Have shamans always been taking them? How do they relate to the synthetic drugs that have been developed in the last couple of centuries? So the history of our relationship to the pharmacologically induced ecstasy. And then finally, and probably we'll get to this uh, this afternoon, the phenomenology of the experience and the techniques for achieving and controlling it. Uh, because this is a practical, there is a practicum here. This is not a course in Mongolian philology or something <laughs> like that. Uh, the ultimate idea is to get those who feel called to the task sufficiently informed and psychically empowered that they can push off into the oceans of mind in the interior with some fair amount of confidence that they'll return to port uh, <laughs> with all hands. So, uh, Let's start sort of with a survey. Let me see, I'm going to talk until 11.30. Uh, so let's start with the survey then and just talk about what the options are. And this will be sort of unstructured and conversational with forays into other areas. First of all, the striking uh, thing when you want to study psychoactive drugs and plants and their impact on human culture, and that's really what interests me, uh, is how drugs affect culture. After I went through Jung and, McLu and, and Iliad, my next port of call was McLuhan. And I absorbed very deeply the notion that media structure civilizations in ways that the civilizations are never aware of. And Jung, of course, talked about print, and manuscript and electronic culture. He did not talk about drugs, but drugs are a form of media because they, information travels through the drug to the mind. That's a medium of communication. And various societies wear drugs uh, like clothing with no awareness of their existence at all, somewhat in the way that a fish relates to water. So that, for instance, if you're in Dublin, you are swimming in the ambiance of an alcohol culture. <laughs> you don't have to be drunk to be in Dublin, although it helps, <laughs> but the, the entire society is premised on the possibility, you see. The entire society is premised on the possibility. In India, the entire society is premised on the possibility of uh, hashish intoxication and social mores, building design, uh, everything takes account of this. 
cultures don't see this. We do not think of ourselves as a meat, sugar, alcohol culture. People do not walk around saying, oh wow, I'm so high on meat, alcohol, and sugar. You know, I can hardly stand it, but they are. And s certain consequences flow from that. So as I make my way through this survey, you need to bear in mind that a culture uh, takes its tone, its clothing, from the drugs that it admits. And you can know a great deal about a culture from the drugs that it excludes, the drugs that it excoriates and fears, uh, because various drugs accentuate and suppress different parts of the psyche. So these are statements about anxiety, about various parts of the psyche. Uh, the striking thing when you set out to do a cultural survey like this is you discover that our culture, the culture of Europe for most of us, some of us are black, some of us are Asian, but the, largely the roots of American culture lie in Europe. This is the most uh, pharmacologically impoverished cultural area on the entire planet. It has the longest history of um, disconnection from any kind of ecstatic intoxication. And the cultural forms of Europe, linear, abstract, narcissistic, and promoting of male dominance, are, to my mind, exactly what you would expect in a culture long deprived of the boundary-dissolving, numinous encounter with the vegetable mind. So uh, a lot of the cultural problems we're dealing with are based on the fact that we as Europeans have no place for drugs. We don't really know quite what to do with that. As, uh, as you move south from Europe into the continent of uh, human origins, Africa, you discover that while Africa supports a tropical ecosystem, which because that means increased speciation of plants, you would think would indicate an increased number of hallucinogens. Africa is surprisingly poor in hallucinogens. This is not well understood. As we go through this survey, I will make reference to numerous unsolved mysteries in the field. And I always try to do this because I'm hoping that there are graduate students listening who are looking for research topics. And there are numerous research areas where important work can be done. One of them is this question of the poverty of hallucinogens in Africa. Why? Uh, does it have something to do with the extreme length of time that Africa has been subject to human impact? Probably. Uh, because Africa is species poor generally for a tropical continent. However, uh, in the interest of thoroughness, there is one uh, hallucinogenic drug complex that should be mentioned because it raises issues that are important for the broader context, and that is uh, Ibogaine, or Tabernantha Iboga, the so-called Bawiti cults of Zaire and Gabon. Now, this is the psychedelic about which we in the West probably know the least. It has spawned no waves of social hysteria. Uh, it has not been the subject of pogroms or uh, media freakout. It's, and it's a powerful hallucinogen. And it's not only a powerful hallucinogen, but it has a, a component of sexual excitation to it which is ancillary and unusual. Uh, if you actually have ever looked into the subject of aphrodisiacs, uh, the truth is there ain't any. Uh, there are things which cause genital itching and prolonged erection and so forth, but a true aphrodisiac, a chemical which would impel you to want to have sex, there's nothing quite like that except this Tabernantha Iboga is very interesting. We tend to think of an aphrodisiac because we tend to break our heart away from our genitals as a kind of a, as a, kind of a cold 
thing, I think. But when you talk to these people who are taking ibogaine, they don't talk about aphrodisiac. They say this causes open-heartedness, one-heartedness, they call it. And one-heartedness is what they are striving for in the Bawiti cult, and they achieve it. And they achieve it, uh, and it allows them to resist cultural incursions by Christian min missionaries. Bawiti is the main cultural force that is holding back uh, conversion to Christianity uh, by these people. Uh, Fang culture, the, the people who are using this Ibogaine, it's an interesting culture. It, there's a great deal of anxiety in Fang culture about divorce because and relationships between men and women divorce is very easily obtained among the fang uh, but it's always followed by extremely lengthy and protracted negotiations with the family of the divorced partner about return of dowry and a huge amount of neurosis and agony and murder and violence goes on over these dowry return negotiations. The Ibogaine stands right in the middle of this as a source of one-heartedness, making divorce less likely. So it's very important as a force for social cohesion. And I mention this because when we reach ayahuasca, we will see, uh, I mean, when we reach South America, we will see ayahuasca functioning not as an aphrodisiac or a thing to unify couples, but as a kind of telepathic pheromone that unifies whole small tribal groups together into a one-hearted, one-minded modality. And if we get into a discussion of the possible evolutionary impact of hallucinogens, we'll see that it always lies in the direction of these collectivized states of mind and uh, dissolution of boundaries uh, between people. Other than Tabernanthia boga, Africa's hallucinogens are trivial, and I won't mention them in the time we have. Cannabis is in Africa as well, but cannabis is worldwide now and probably has been for quite some time. Cannabis is a special case chemically and culturally. We tend to think of cannabis as a recreational drug, but that's because in the 20th century we always smoke our cannabis. In the 18th and 19th century, cannabis was eaten and jellied forms of cannabis that were eaten, judging by the prose of people like Theodore Gautier, Baudelaire, um, Fitzhugh Ludlow, and people like that, it was as powerful as LSD, without doubt. I mean, these people were being swept in tight to titanically alien uh, dimensions. Well, when we cross from Africa to India, India, interestingly, of course, as you all know, tremendous depth of at least concern with the spiritual dimension, if not realization of it. That's a tougher call. Uh, uh, India um, would be a likely place to look for indigenous hallucinogenic plant cults simply because of the spiritual obsession that characterizes Indian thought. When we look at the historical foundations of Indian thought, we find that it all rests on a group of texts composed between 4,500 and 2,000 years ago called the Vedas. And the Vedas are nothing less but the world's longest continuing advertisement for a hallucinogenic plant. The problem is we don't know what this plant is. This is the mysterious soma of the Rig Vedas. And uh, Mandala 9 of the Rig Veda is an entirely a hymn to Soma. Soma held uh, Hinduism of the Vedic phase together. Later, it was repressed. And again, graduate students pay attention. One of the very interesting problems to be looked at by sociologists, social psychologists, and anthropologists is how, if a drug once discovered, or a plant once discovered, is so wonderful, 
How can these things ever be lost or forgotten? And yet in several instances we deal with literatures which sing the praises of some plant or drug, the identity of which we cannot figure out, or it becomes a, a big arm wrestle between various competing schools of scholarship. We do not to this day know what Soma was. Rob, uh, Gordon Wasson, who uh, some of you may know as the discoverer, the modern discoverer of the mushroom cults of Mexico, founder of the science of ethnomycology, believed to his dying breath that Soma was Amanita muscaria, the red-topped, white, speckled Amanita. Um, this is a mushroom which has a major role in Tungusic and Arctic shamanism, but to say, as Wasson did, that this is the supreme entheogen of all time uh, is not supported by the evidence, I think. Wasson's own efforts to become intoxicated on Amanita muscaria were not successful. Uh, my efforts have not been successful. Occasionally you will hear anecdotal evidence. Someone will tell a story about eating Amanita muscaria that obviously they had a staggering breakthrough to a uh, rupture of plane, as Mersiliad in his wonderful phrase. But it's extremely undependable. And when you look at the botany of Amanita muscaria, you discover that its chemical constituency is seasonally variant, genetically variant, uh, geographically variant, and so forth. So often, I think, as we gain understanding of a given shamanism, we will see that it depended on an extremely deep local knowledge. And if you take what a Yakut shaman says about Amanita muscaria and attempt to apply it in the national forests of New Mexico, you know, you could end up with a tag on your toe. Uh, these things do, this kind of information doesn't travel well. One of the, one of the, you know, there are old shamans and bold shamans, but there are no old, bold shamans. <laughs> In looking at the Indian subcontinent for other hallucinogens uh, that may have made a contribution, uh, the obvious one, to my mind, is Stropharia cubensis, the mushroom which grows in the dung of cows and that the book my brother and I was, uh, wrote was about. Other possibilities, some of you may know that there are a family of uh, the Argeria family of uh, morning glories, an Asian family of morning glories distributed from India to, the, to uh, Micronesia, 13 species, all containing psychoactive ergot alkaloids, none with an, a history of human usage. Now, this is another area which really fascinates me. Uh, why do some plants become discovered by human beings and become the objects of cults which last millennia and others are never discovered at all in societies absolutely obsessed with spiritual advancement? This Argeria nervosa is a perfect example because you take the seeds, the seeds are the active part, and you don't need much of this thing. You need uh, four or five seeds, less than a tablespoon of plant material, which I would bet would make it per unit volume, probably one of the most powerful hallucinogens in nature, and uh, the hallucinations are absolutely stunning and nobody has ever claimed this. It's free for the taking. This means you can cut a deal with an ally that doesn't belong to the Hindus, the Mayans, or the somebody else. It's an unoccupied parking space <laughs> in uh, hyperspace. And uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the discoveries are continuous. Uh, just a year ago, 
uh, some phytochemists in the Midwest discovered uh, a new a plant. It's always been there. Nobody's ever taken it very seriously. Treated it like a weed. Desmanthus elenoiensis, the Illinois bundleweed. This is suggestive that it's called bundleweed because a medicine bundle is, of course, a shaman's mojo bag, you know. But so bundleweed. 6% by dry weight, NN dimethyltryptamine, the largest concentration of DMT in any plant, and unclaimed by native peoples, unknown to the folk medicine of the North American Indians as far as, as uh, we can tell. Well, so this is very interesting. Um, Continuing our survey, uh, since we're now somewhere on the Eurasian continent, we should mention uh, uh, a Papaver Somniforum, the opium poppy. With cannabis, this is probably the oldest human narcotic known. Uh, in the, the later phase of Minoan civilization was entirely based on opium on the use of opium. And in fact, when Michael Ventris translated the tablets, the Linear B tablets, they got these tallies and they thought at first that the symbol for opium must be the symbol for wheat because the tallies were so huge of the stuff being moved and sold. And then when they sorted out, they realized, no, in the, for the last thousand years of its existence, the Minoan civilization drifted deeper and deeper into an opium narcosis that was its way, I think, of anesthetizing the pain of the death of this last outpost of the goddess religion, because that's what it was. It was a cultural anachronism. While Asia Minor had gone over to God King's city states and bronze tipped spears, the people of Minoan Crete had kept the old, old archaic religion that came out of Africa. And then in the last gasp of that Minoan culture, those mysteries were handed on to the mainland of Greece and became the mysteries at, uh, at Eleusis and, uh, and other cult sites. It was said by the, by the commentators, contemporary commentators of the Hellenistic world, the, site, the, the rites practiced in secret at Eleusis are practiced in public at Knossos. And this, this was the difference, you know, the going underground of the old proto-Minoan mother religion. Uh, in modern times, we have a horror of opium. Uh, I mean, people are amazed that I even mention it in the same breath, but it doesn't hurt to remind ourselves that this virulently addictive substance, opium, was not even noticed to be addictive by anybody until 1627 when the English physician John Playfair, for the first time, commented that opium once taken over a long period of time, then there would be a requirement that it be taken uh, throughout life. Um, we're right in the middle of a drug war at the moment, and it's interesting in that context to uh, uh, notice how the goals of drug wars can change. A hundred years ago, uh, the British Navy was involved in what was called the Opium Wars in China. Very few people in the modern world have bothered to inform themselves to find out that the opium wars were about the right of the British government to deal opium. The Emperor of China did not want opium dealt in the ports of China. And the British government used cannon to enforce their desire to uh, sell opium in the ports of China. Why were the English trying to sell opium in the ports of China? because the tea trade had collapsed through overproduction and they were stuck with all these tea ships. They had created a whole global infrastructure for the sale of tea. When the market fell out on tea, they just turned to opium. They grew it in Goa and they sold it in China. 
And this was government policy less than 120 years ago. Okay, well, uh, moving on then from Eurasia, and I'm sure I'm missing different things, but if I missed your favorite thing, bring it up in the question period, uh, to the North American continent. And the North American continent is, uh, I almost said, similarly cursed like Europe, but that's just my prejudice. The North American continent is similarly poor in hallucinogens. Uh, there are no very interesting hallucinogens in North America and North American Indians, North American culture, did not avail itself of this ecstatic plant-induced shamanism. It tended more to go for what's called ordeal shamanism, the Sundance thing where you hang yourself by your pectorals on hooks and stuff like that. I mean, there are other ways to attain these visions. But you see, that absence of good hallucinogens in North America just reinforced that whole beer and woolen and uptight thing that came from Europe. Uh, the only major hallucinogen to have a role in Native American culture is, uh, of course, peyote. And many people, without informing themselves, imagine that peyote is something which goes millennia into the past, and that it, and this is absolutely not true. Peyote use may well be less than a thousand years old among Native Americans. When you go back into the old graves and the old burial sites, in the Rio Grande Valley and South, you don't find peyote. What you find are the beans of Sephora secundifolia. You all probably know this plant, though you may not know its name. It's the plant that produces the very hard red and black bean that they can, can string. If you all know what colarines are, these are erythrinas, which are related to these things. Okay, that stuff contains uh, uh, cytosine, and cysteine. This is, uh, these are what are called ordeal poisons. And it might be worthwhile to just talk for a minute about ordeal poisons. I said there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to have this experience that shoves you through to an awareness of the numinous. That's what we're trying to do, is have an awareness of the numinous. Well, in certain parts of the world, where hallucinogens were not present in the biome, people concentrated on ordeal poisons. And what an ordeal poison is, is it's a chemical compound that you take it and you think you're going to die and you beg for death and you do not die. You get better, you're fine. And you're so damn glad to be alive <laughs> that you undergo an abreaction. You get straight, you shed some of your complexes, and you make a, you turn over a new leaf, is, uh, <laughs> is what it is. Well, in Madagascar, these ordeal poisons have been brought to a high state of perfection. Also in Malaya, there's a poison complex that replaces a hallucinogenic drug complex, and these are horrific poisons. So. Uh, what apparently was going on in the Rio Grande Valley was after centuries of this Sephora secundifolia cult, someone discovered peyote and said, my God, <laughs> you know, thank God. And then the other, the other plant which was big in the, in the uh, Southern California, Northern Mexico and across the Southwest were the uh, uh, tropane-containing detouras the so-called Talach religion of Southern California. Well, these are deliriant confusants that are, unless you have a psychic constitution that is not like mine, you can't take these things. They're too, I just found them confusing. It was like a kind of madness and also physically very difficult to handle. I experimented, I had a phase with these things when I was in Nepal because there are sadhus, 
holy men in the Kathmandu Valley who swear by this stuff. And if you're in Kathmandu, you may notice in the gutter, well, you'll notice plenty in the gutter, but you may also notice these deturopods, empty deturopods, and I noticed them and started asking questions. And then out at the King's Game Preserve past Pashupatinath, I found a bunch of these things and laid in a supply. And, uh, but it is an occult, watery, it's a dimension of confusion, not a dimension of high awareness. And I think some of you have heard me tell the story about the reason I gave it up was an Englishman, a friend of mine who lived in this little village in Nepal where I lived, he was also experimenting with this stuff. And one day I was buying potatoes and tomatoes in the market and I ran into him and we started having a conversation. And in the course of the conversation, he revealed that he believed we were in his apartment. <laughs> and then I knew <laughs> that, uh, you know, we were, we were losing hold on our grounding. Uh, so I don't recommend that. I don't have a whole lot to say about it. Apparently, it's a, it's a thing for magic, power magic. And I've never been particularly interested in that because I'm afraid of it. I'm a, I'm a watcher. I like to look. I like to get very close to it and watch it. But I'm not into grabbing it or doing anything with it. I, I have a feeling that would lead to catastrophe uh, for me personally. Uh, okay, where are we now? Northern Mexico. Now we've gone all around. We started in Europe. We went down into Africa, across the Eurasian continent, North America, northern Mexico. Now things get interesting because as you leave the Sonoran uplands and go south in the Sierra Mazateca, uh, it is this mushroom complex which Valentina and Gordon Wasson discovered in the 1953s. 17 to 22 species, it depends on who's counting, of extremely endemic, meaning very localized species of mushrooms, all producing psilocybin, uh, coincident with the Mayan, the cultural site of the Mayan, Mixtec, and Mazatecan civilizations. And this is psilocybin an extraordinarily powerful, visionary, and benign hallucinogenic metabolite. Once the Wassons had nailed down this Mexican mushroom complex, then people started checking and they discovered these mushrooms or conspecific species in many localities. Uh, two that are worth mentioning are the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, which appears to be the world center for species density of the psilocybin gene. And strangely enough, very good ethnographic research turns up no hint that these uh, Quaqutl, Shimsham, Tlingit, and other people had any hint of this. They lived in the center of the psilocybin distribution complex, and as far as we can tell, their shamanism, which was highly evolved, never discovered or made use of this. Not so, these civilizations of Mesoamerica. The other place where these mushrooms have now been discovered, and the range seems to be extending every year, is uh, Europe. The tragedy of European civilization is that the Logos was apparently there all the time. Uh, uh, the English countryside, I understand, is now practically a scene of annual mushroom runs that are not unlike the lemming runs of Scandinavia. And everybody pours out to, to collect the semi-lanciata mushrooms. The, I've been told, I haven't been to these sites, but I've been told that uh, Ionia, where the Book of Kells was composed and where uh, St. Columba went, is covered with mushrooms. It's very clearly a uh, an mushroom ecology. Attention, graduate students, the tracing of mushroom motifs in European art and civilization and culture is an extremely rich 
untapped field. Uh, if you need some clues, uh, look at family escutcheons. Look at family crests. Uh, in, Fran in France and the Italian parts of France, the Morelli family has the Morel on their escutcheon. Uh, there are other mushroom families and mushroom uh, names. So uh, there may have been, you know, this may have been the struggle between paganism and Christianity may have revolved uh, around a mushroom. We know druids were into plants. We know they were into oak groves. But uh, the plant that is always mentioned as the druidic, psychedelic, psychic plant of choice is mistletoe. But mistletoe is chemically very disappointing. And I've wondered if mistletoe is not... It wasn't the plant they wanted to symbolize. They wanted to symbolize the symbiosis of one plant upon another. It's that the mistletoe symbolizes epiphytic existence. Uh, anyway, this is an, un, uh, an untapped area. Once you get into the New World tropics, then you are in the great domain of, uh, of the hallucinogenic plants. And no one knows why it is that the tropics of the New World are tremendously rich in hallucinogens. I mean, I don't know how many of you are botanists or, or biologists, but try to imagine uh, figuring out a set of evolutionary constraints that were operating on one side of the planet, but not on the other. You know, when we take, for instance, the jungles of southern Colombia and compare them with, let us say, the jungles of New Guinea, these are both continental floras, both equatorial, both climaxed at a species-rich climax, and one has dozens of hallucinogens in it, and the other has none. None. Uh, this is not well understood. I mean, theories range as wildly as, uh, obviously, that South America must be where the flying saucer landed. And, uh, you know, that's where the genes were seeded. Uh, I, I confess, I'm not sure why it is. Uh, at first, I thought that it had to do with the extremely primitive state, so-called primitive, the extremely archaic state of culture in the South American jungles, that they represent a real Stone Age culture, where when you go into Indonesia, it may look primitive to you, but the Dutch were there before the English arrived in North America. Uh, it is, it has had centuries and centuries for which, in which these things could be forgotten. But of course, then come the botanists who care nothing for ethnographic data and who simply carry out uh, plant surveys and chemical analysis of plants. They can't find these hallucinogens either. So this is a great mystery. In the tropics of, the, um, of, of Mesoamerica and, uh, and uh, the equatorial tropics of the New World, there's a vast uh, panoply of hallucinogens, not only the mushroom complex, but then also this ayahuasca or yahe complex that we've referred to several times. Uh, this is a huge jungle vine and as we cross into the Yahe area, we also cross, we, we cross an interesting um, barrier because we move from plants, single plants, which are hallucinogenically active, into the realm of preparations. We're on the threshold of the concept drug here because what ayahuasca is, is uh, two plants which are not active unless brought into combination with each other. One plant uh, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor and the other plant contains DMT which would be destroyed in the gut if taken orally unless it were taken orally in the presence of an MAO inhibitor. Well, this was not understood by Western pharmacology until 1956. 
but it was understood by Amazonian shamans millennia ago. So they bring these two things together and by varying the ratio between the plant containing the beta carbolines that inhibit MAO and the plants that contain DMT, they can intensify or uh, de-emphasize the visions. Well, most of the um, most of the hallucinogens in the Amazon basin run on tryptamine of some sort, uh, uh, usually DMT. In the upper basin of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, like that, you get these banisteri, these uh, yahe ayahuasca beverages. These are things you drink and then it comes on, you have these outlandish trips. As you go down into the lower basin, the Banisteriopsis cult gives way to these snuff cults, Ibina and Neopo, depending on the languages. These are, don't depend on an MAO inhibitor for their activity because they're absorbed through the subnasal mucosa, which is an extremely effective way for getting drugs uh, into the system. The problem with these, with that complex, the snuff complex, is that we are just physically such delicate and wimpy people that we can't stand that root route of drug administration because what they do is they toast these seeds of Anadonanthera peregrina this huge leguminous tree, which is the source of the seeds, they toast these seeds and powder them. So what you get is a kind of rough cross between sawdust and charcoal. And then they have a hollow tube about this long, and they load it up with this stuff. And you squat down and put the nostril, the tube into your nostril, and your friend, your friend, not you, because you would not do it hard enough. Your friend then takes a huge breath of air and and it's just like being hit in the face with a, a two by four. I mean, it's like being hit in the face and you fall over backwards, you scream, you salivate, you squirm around there in the dirt for a minute or two, and then you sit back up and by that time, the tube has been reloaded for the other nostril. <laughs> and then, you know, and your eyes, your sinuses can't believe what's happening to you. <laughs> so you have to sort out this whole sinus uh, shock, which is going on in parallel with then an evolving strange state of mind, which is beginning to take over and, uh, and clarify everything. And then there are numerous minor variations uh, on these themes. Uh, might talk just a little bit about the chemistry of these things and the chemistry of hallucinogens generally. My attitude toward uh, these, uh, this question of plants, compounds, drugs, should these things be used for spiritual growth, uh, if the answer is no, then that finishes. You don't have to go any further. If the answer is maybe or yes, then other questions arise. Which compounds out of this whole survey and at what frequency and at what dosage and under what uh, circumstances? And over the years, I've sort of evolved a three-way test that I will share with you because I think it's maybe the operationally the most useful thing you'll hear this weekend. And that is, if you are contemplating some, some compound, some plant, then the first thing to ask yourself is, does it occur in nature? Does it have some tangentiality to what is already existing? Because obviously what exists, that's nature, has undergone some uh, vast winnowing process out of the set of all things which might exist. In that wonderful phrase of Alfred North Whitehead's, certain things have undergone the formality of actually occurring. 
you know. And, the, and, and so certain, dr certain compounds have undergone the formality of actually occurring in the biological matrix. And so they should be, they should be our pool out of which our experimental compound should be drawn. But this is thousands of compounds. How can we further narrow it? Well, uh, an excellent way of narrowing it further is to ask the question of this compound, does it have a history of human usage? Does it have a history of human usage? That is your uh, FDA approval. <laughs> because if you can point to a tribe of people who have been taking this plant or mushroom or whatever it is for millennia, and they don't have miscarriages, tumors, cataracts, blindness, Down syndrome, eight fingers on the left hand, or whatever it is, then you can be fairly confident that this thing is benign, that these people have observed its action on pregnant women, the elderly, the, those with, you know, and, and that it has passed uh, uh, that test. Then, finally, the, mo the narrowest gate through which a compound has to go to to intersect my precious body, is it has to have an affinity to ordinary brain chemistry. It has to have an affinity to ordinary brain chemistry. We don't want to launch something on your brain that it can't recognize at all, that it has no biosynthetic pathways to degrade, that it has no receptors for just some crazy thing, you know, 5-amino-3-triethylphenthioanaxidine or something. We don't want that. That is not the spirit that we're acting in here. Uh, so if the compound can get through those three barriers, then it's an excellent candidate for uh, providing spiritual gain at low physiological uh, impact. Well, now some people may say, oh, well, you've taken all the fun out of it. All the good things have been tossed aside in this mad rush to purity or something. Not at all. <laughs> the very best stuff was retained in this process because uh, in terms of relative strength and bizarreness of effect and so forth, the strangest, the most powerful, the most transformative of all hallucinogens in nature or out is dimethyltryptamine, DMT. And uh, it's worth talking about DMT for a moment because it will raise certain issues and distinctions that you may not have been aware of. First of all, DMT is hands down the most powerful of all hallucinogens. I mean, it is so powerful that whatever's in second place is lost over the horizon. <laughs> yet, yet, it is the most benign of all hallucinogens because it occurs as an endogenous neurotransmitter in the normal human brain. We, every single one of us at this moment, have NN dimethyltryptamine being synthesized, activated, and degraded in our uh, synaptic membrane. So this is almost a paradox. The most benign of all hallucinogens, the most fast-acting, I should also add, is also the most harmless, the, the easiest to take. It sort of remove, it sort of puts a certain obligation on the experience, because there is no reason to hold back except that there is this question, uh, does it drive you mad? And then the more serious version of that question, oh, what about the possibility of death by astonishment? <laughs> this is no joke. Uh, death by astonishment is, I, I think, probably the major risk we run uh, with this stuff because the impact of the breakthrough is, uh, is so total, so complete, so unexpected. 
And in a way, this sort of brings me back around to my theme, because I encountered DMT, LSD, all of these things in that very period when I was getting set to uh, take flight as a Jungian analyst. And what completely blew my mind about DMT, and uh, I mention it in a, again, here's an opportunity for research, is how tran here's a heretical construction, how trans archetypal the content of the flash seemed. I was appalled because not only had I a certain amount of interest in Jung and proclivity along those lines, but my original major had been art history. Art historians, what we're trained to do is to be able to look at a motif and say, oh yes, I'm familiar from, with this from ceramic from second millennia Peru and also Mandayan uh, uh, embroidery work. We know motifs. We're trained to recognize and connect disparate aesthetic domains. Well, when I smoked DMT and came down, I said, you know, this is not on the map. I can't believe it. That This doesn't connect up to anything. How can there be domains of the human mind that do not announce themselves in folklore, fairy tales, dreams, or mandala painting that are so removed from the ven of what is human that they are apparently not accessible in structuring our uh, maps of our self and our psyche. And that for me was the contact with what I call, and I didn't call it this, Rudolf Otto called it this, and this term influenced Jung, Otto preceded Jung, was it is the holy other. And if there is an archetype of the holy other, then this is it. But perhaps the holy other transcends the archetypes. This may explain to some degree Jung's interest in Gnosticism, especially the Valentinian school of Gnosticism, which holds, you know, that there is a higher and hidden father, all God, who is outside the machinery of cosmic fate. And it seemed to me that in those extremely profound DMT flashes, I was actually witnessing a domain outside the machinery of the archetypes, which is for us as moderns, that's what the machinery of fate is. It's not zodiacal machinery, it's hardwiring in our psychology and our genes that gives us our fate. Well, so having said that, uh, I've not only made the, the survey, but also brought us to, by ending with DMT, the subject matter of this quest. And I want to make it clear, I speak about the power of the psychedelic experience because I think people should be informed of their birthright. And I feel very antsy around the notion that someone might go from birth to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience. It makes me as antsy as the notion that somebody might go from birth to the grave without having a sexual experience. It's a strange kind of uh, protective denial or a, a, a kind of expression of fear. This is our birthright. This is part of what it means to be human. These altered states of consciousness, I think, are pretty much scripted in to the existence of women because they, most of them will give birth, which is an organically scripted psychedelic experience from which there is no escape unless, of course, you go for the drug knockout, the spinal, and then you miss everything. But biologically, physiologically, women are set up for uh, this experience. Men are not. It's possible to build such barriers against overwhelmment that it never happens in your whole life. And I believe that if we psychologically analyze the effects of these uh, 
psychedelics, what they do is they dissolve boundaries. That's all. I mean, if you interview 10,000 people who've had a psychedelic trip, each one has their own hierophany, their own hieroscamos that unfolded for them, but the sum total of it is boundaries dissolve, and then whatever's on the other side of your boundary comes flooding in to claim you and to, and to reshape and remake your psyche. Well, I see the entire illness of our civilization as an, as an ego inflationary illness. We have gone so sick with ego that we are literally murdering the planet rather than confronting the consequences of our uh, psychic imbalance. And uh, the psychedelics act to redress this. They are almost an inoculation against the ego. And I, I see the ego as a phenomenon arising in historical time, or ra rather, actually, history is caused by the ego. But the ego is a component of the psyche that arose in the post-archaic phase, in the post-psychedelic phase. Uh, it's entirely a modern invention. It's less than 15,000 years old, and the assumptions of the ego are the source of our neurosis, our disequilibrium. Why did the ego arise? It arose because of the climatologically enforced abandonment of these psychedelic religions of the archaic period. In other words, here is the scenario as I see it. Um, primates, even primitive, even uh, I don't non-advanced primates like squirrel monkeys, howler monkeys, these kinds of primates, all have male dominance hierarchies. The whole thing with primates is about male dominance, S but. Uh, a lot of things about human beings mark us as the most unique member of the primate group. Uh, obviously, we look different from any other monkeys. Even the stranger monkeys look more like the normal monkeys than, than we look like them or they lo uh, look like us. us. Our upright posture, the other thing about us is our suppressed estrus cycle. We cannot tell at a glance whether a woman is uh, in heat or not. And yet, obviously, that had a tremendous shaping force on the social psychology of, uh, of the primates. I believe that everything about us that is noble and worth saving uh, occurs against the grain. That if we had followed the grain, we would still be uh, competing with jackals for the carcasses left by lions of uh, large game kills on the plains of Africa. But when the African continent began to dry up and we were forced out of the trees where we had an arboreal vegetarian lifestyle, we came under great pressure to expand our diet and the, I believe that the great unstudied factor in human evolution and human emergence is the effect of a complex diet on our emerging species. And it's not only the presence of hallucinogens such as psilocybin in the, in the diet, but other things as well. Psilocybin is the most spectacular case, and you know, if you came to see Darwin, you'd have to hear about evolution, so you came to see me, so you have to hear this little theory about human emergence. And most of you can probably recite it by heart now. Uh, but it's a three-step three feedback loop from a fairly bright monkey to a fairly stupid human being. 
<laughs> and uh, the way it works like this, these monkeys come down out of the trees, they're uh, predating on, on kills of, of ungulate mammals made by lions, they're competing with jackals, they're testing all the foods in the environment and lo and behold, in the manure of these ungulate mammals that are irradiating across the African continent, uh, there are what are called coprophytic mushrooms. And the presence of large amounts of tryptophan in manure as a substrate means that these coprophytic mushrooms elaborate psilocybin. So here in this new grassland environment are the psilocybin mushrooms. Well, uh, these proto hominid creatures testing foods for their diet would reach the psilocybin and would test it. Well, then this three-part feedback loop to humanness then comes into play. And it works like this. Very, very light doses of psilocybin, so light that you cannot an hour and a half or two hours later tell you've taken anything say, I don't feel it, I feel completely normal, I must not have taken enough. That dose, if you would submit yourself to being tested by an optometric apparatus, we could show you that your vision has improved slightly. This is an effect of eating small amounts of psychoactive amines, uh, increase of visual acuity. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that if you're a hunting animal competing in a highly competitive environment and suddenly somebody hands you a pair of chemical binoculars, <laughs> you are going to be a more successful hunter than other members of your uh, species who are not availing themselves of this food item. So there was reinforcement there. Aha! If we eat these mushrooms in small amounts, we will be more successful hunters. Or maybe it was never raised to consciousness as an if-then relationship. It was just, we eat mushrooms, we hunt well, kind of uh, thing. <laughs> then, if you eat slightly more of the psilocybin, if you bring slightly more of it into your diet, uh, it's what's called a CNS stimulator, central nervous system stimulant. An effect of all CNS stimulants is what's called uh, arousal. And arousal means simply that you can't sit still, you're very restless, you're very energetic, and often in the male animal you have an erection. It's an overall systemic arousal. Arousal. And uh, if, you, if, you give, if you witness this situation in monkeys, monkeys are very hang-loose kind of characters, and so then they just all fall together in a heap and make love. Uh, and this uh, increases what anthropologists and primatologists like to call successful instances of copulation. This means that this increased in interest in sex in combination with an increased success in obtaining food is creating the perfect situation in which there will be a population boom of these creatures. They're eating better, they're enjoying themselves more, and they have better relationships with each other. So population boom is on the way. Well then, the next and final level is when you raise the dose higher, so you're no longer restless or interested in sex or any of that, but you're flattened with the ecstatic unfolding of the full, numinous, hallucinogenic rupture of plane, then, and this occurs, uh, you know, in the tribal context, then there is boundary dissolution, uh, group sexual activity, and group bonding and identification. And this is where uh, this telepathic coherence, this inner dynamic of, of cohesion and caring that we see in primitive people to some small degree and that we imagine must, must once have been our birthright, this is where it came to be. And at those higher levels of psilocybin, 
uh, most of you probably know, language is formed by an organ on one side of the brain called Broca's area. Uh, Broca's area, the brain being always symmetrically constructed, Broca's area has a twin on the opposite side of the brain, but no one knows what's going on there. It's apparently a silent area of the brain. Well, when you take psilocybin, there is spontaneous linguistic activity, glossolalia. Henry Munn has written about this in his essay, The Mushrooms of Language. It's almost as though psilocybin is a pheromone that promotes linguistic activity, an effort to take v verbal intentionality and connect it up to the ontos of being in some way. And then it's almost as though words are born out of you. You give birth to words. And uh, these concrescences of meaning then create a kind of unitary ambiance which we call understanding. Language is a miracle. I mean, make no mistake about it. I don't think any amount of dissection of monkeys or human cadavers will give you any insight into language. Language is a behavior of some sort so bizarre, so many orders of magnitude more complex than anything else we do, that for all practical purposes this is the thumbprint of God upon creation. Human language. And it's a self-transforming uh, thing. It keeps bootstrapping itself to higher and higher levels and it creates for us the entire ambiance of reality. Once we had words, we quickly replaced reality with them. And so I'm, I believe that what psilocybin promotes is cognitive activity. The coordination of visual input with plans and strategies for hunting or acquisition or whatever. Uh, it promotes this uh, increased arousal, which really, in a way, this arousal is nothing more than a reclaiming of your animal body. You feel restless, you feel your muscles, you feel your genitals, you feel your place in space and time. You are reclaiming your body, and then finally, it inducts you into this domain of uh, the Logos a religious hierophany, something that we as moderns are absolutely as in awe of as our mushroom-munching ancestors 25,000 years ago. We can't reduce it. We don't know what it is. You know, Jung was always so concerned that people say it's only psychological, it's only the psyche. I've got news for you. It may only be the psyche, but the psyche is all there is. And uh, as, as we came into a relationship with the mushroom, humanness emerged on the African veldt and was able to stabilize itself for a few millennia. And then uh, we fell into history because of climatological change for many reasons. But we literally fell into history. And now we operate in this lower domain a domain of limitation, of misunderstanding, of low-grade languages, uh, but the, and, and we are neurotic, we are unhappy, we are dysfunctional, and I believe this is because our connection to the Logos, to the informing voice that gives meaning to being, has been broken. Over 10,000 years it's fallen away. And all we're left with is our spiritual yearnings, our nostalgia for paradise, and uh, our, our pathologies. And, miraculously, we are left with the time capsule of preservation represented by the rainforest shamanic cultures that use hallucinogens. There lies our answer. But it's like the Ouroboric serpent taking its tail in its mouth. The, the salvation of the super future of the planet lies in a recovery of the values, modalities, and religious practices of 25 to 50,000 years ago. Break, break, break. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm going to disappear if someone... And we haven't screened the pile, so we're just going to go through them and uh, I'll, I'll read them aloud. And Normally I give long answers, but there's such a stack of questions here, I'll try and be General Neal and keep... <laughs> <laughs> or General Brief and keep it Neal. <laughs> Since DMT is present in the brain, does the introduction of excess DMT shut down the production of natural DMT in the way that the body stops producing opiates during opium usage? If so, what are the effects? Is DMT really so perfectly chemically benign? The first point to make is that many of your questions cannot be answered because research into these areas is not allowed. So uh, often uh, we can't answer your question. This question, does the introduction of excess DMT uh, limit endogenous production? I can say with fair confidence that that's never been studied. My guess would be that it does not because the DMT is n in no sense of the word do you become habituated to DMT. I mean, a person who does DMT once a year is a fanatically heavy user, I would say. <laughs> And, uh, and the question, is DMT really so chemically benign? Again, this has not been studied the way you would study with rats and so forth to determine it. But experientially speaking, the amazing thing about DMT is the speed with which you return to normal. You return to the baseline of consciousness in under 10 minutes. Well, that tells you that the brain is very well able to deal with this compound. One way of judging how toxic a drug or a plant is, is to ask yourself the question, how long after I take it do I feel completely normal? And with DMT you feel completely normal 15 minutes after taking it. It's the shortest recovery time of any uh, drug. This question is concerning the bundle weed. While it does not directly meet the criteria of long-term use, is it to be considered safe? I'd say the way to answer that question is to do a chemical analysis of the bundle weed. If there's nothing present but DMT in it, I sh would think it should be considered safe. Now, there may be other compounds present. Uh, in South America, uh, it's possible to contrast two plants, uh, Psychotria viridis, which has almost entirely nothing in it except DMT as the portion of its alkaloid fraction, or Varola, uh, Varola carthaginensis, which is uh, in, used in the making of snuff, and chemically it's a mess. It looks like they swept the floor. You've got NNDMT, 5-MeO-DMT, alpha-methyltryptamine, monomethyltryptamine, 6-hydroxyomethyltryptamine. All of this, this you don't want. You want a, a narrow, a surgical strike on the synapse is uh, what you're going for. Not splattering all kinds of junk all over the place. Uh, what is the best medium for psilocybin spore germination? Uh, potato agar or what? Uh, the best medium is rye malt agar. No question about it. Go with rye. Organic, <laughs> Organic rye malt extract. In today's climate, talk about access to shamanic pharmaceuticals for the average person. This is the where do I get it question. <laughs> dressed up in respectable terms. <laughs> well, uh, without being too self-serving, let me say my brother and I wrote a book on cultivating mushrooms called Psilocybin, the Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide by Otios and Owen Eric. I'm Otios, as you can see. <laughs> and um, I really believe in growing mushrooms. Uh, if you are, as you sit here, not psychically strong enough or balanced enough to take psilocybin, then if you learn to grow it at the end of that process, you will be. <laughs> because growing the mushroom teaches you cleanliness, punctuality, 
attention to detail, uh, uh, steadiness, all of these virtues which are the very virtues you need to travel smoothly in that dimension. Other hallucinogens, other shamanic hallucinogens that you will find easily available to you without breaking any laws. Uh, the heavenly blue morning glories sold in every seed store and garden store are not to be taken. Do not take them. They have been dipped in a fungicide that will make you sick. Grow them and collect your crop and take that. And uh, this is a major hallucinogen of, uh, of great antiquity, extremely visionary. Um, the Hawaiian wood rose, uh, you can obtain this from uh, uh, people who make dried flower arrangements, often have these. Uh, pay attention, you want the Hawaiian baby wood rose. If they try to give you something called Hawaiian wood rose, a big clunky thing, that is inactive and, uh, and won't do it. Um, the detouras are freely available. I do not recommend them. I recommend against them, but they're a common landscaping plant in Southern California, and the jimson weed, of course, is growing out in the desert, out around Lancaster and other places like that. Uh, there are a couple of companies which have very uh, forthrightly decided to sell plants with a history of shamanic involvement. I have owned no stock in these companies, so uh, I can recommend them without fear or favoritism. Uh, one is called Of the Jungle up in Sebastopol, California. And the other one is called Dream Gardens, and I think it's here in Santa Monica. These, both of these groups publish astonishingly complete catalogs of psychoactive and shamanically uh, important plants. Okay, that's access without going to the streets or committing crimes or anything like that. Can you tell us any more about Illinois bundleweed? I just did. Um, and that's really all I can tell you about it. All these questions are the same question. Having convinced us of the wonder of DMT, what would be the easiest and quickest way to obtain it? <laughs> How does one acquire DMT? Comment about the Supreme Court ruling against the use of peyote by North American uh, Indians. Um, a very bad law, obviously. Law so bad that the National Council of Churches, the National Jewish Affairs Committee, and some very large Catholic organization all filed briefs protesting this thing. And I think that it was actually realized that it was a goof and it will be brought back in the... It, you can't bring something back to the Supreme Court in a hurry because then that's unseemly. But I would bet that within five to ten years this will be overturned because a, a close reading of this law means that uh, wine for Pesach or communion could be construed as a psychoactive substance and uh, the whole thing it was just bad law, bad idea. Has consideration been given to the possibility that, in the case of certain plants, which are recounted in writings, but the identity is unknown, that the reason they are unknown is because shamans purposefully kept their identity a secret. Perhaps such secrets are still being kept. This goes to this question I raised this morning. How can a powerful hallucinogen, once discovered, ever be lost? And I've only been able to figure out one scenario in which this could happen. It happens like this. Uh, people discover a wonderful plant that imparts visions or insight or something. And everybody takes it and enjoys it. And then slowly a hierarchy emerges, a professional class, priests, and only they, they decree that only they will be allowed to take it. And then they lord it over the rest of society with an iron hand 
and then the rest of the society gets fed up with that and there's a slave revolt and everybody in the ruling class is killed and the sacrament is lost. I can't figure out any other way that it could happen. And the Vedic thing, this seems quite reasonable. Obviously, Soma was being more and more confined in its use to a single class and then that class be became viewed as obnoxious and its overthrow and the death of this sacrament then follow each other. Perhaps such secrets are still being kept. Uh, perhaps they are. I, the fact that this bundle weed could turn up at so late a date probably means that there are shamanic lineages with secrets that we don't know. As a, as a field ethnobotanist and an explorer, I'm always interested in the unconfirmable rumor. And there are some doozies. Uh, the mysterious beetle from eastern Brazil which causes intense hallucinogens if eaten. Here's a career for somebody. No hallucinogenic insect has ever been found and yet there are persistent rumors in different parts of the world of either a butterfly or a beetle that is uh, uh, hallucinogenic. Most shamans in the Amazon, if you spend five or six weeks with them and take ayahuasca with them and tromp around with them, when you finally get to know them, they will allow as how there are, is another magic, which they call the magic of the big trees. And I've spent half my life trying to find out the names of the big trees and I'm still working on it. We have collectors in Peru and nothing is more exciting than a clump of rootstock or a seed packet that comes across our desk labeled suspect hallucinogen. <laughs> that, that gets me to the edge of my chair. <laughs> what do you think of Robert Monroe, the journey out of the body man? Uh, well, this is a good uh, time to discuss what do I think of all these other things on the spiritual market. Uh, I don't know what to think about them. I'm not a spiritual consumer. Uh, I've never been to a workshop that wasn't my own unless it was free. And uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, astral traveling, channeling, all of this stuff. And I tend to either believe it's bogus or it's for people with a psychic constitution considerably different from my own. Uh, sometimes people say to me, well, these states that you're talking about, can't they be achieved without drugs? Well, the answer to that is, my God, who would want to? <laughs> what, what would be proved by achieving these things without drugs? If the things I'm talking about began to happen to me without drugs, I would be very, very concerned and alarmed. <laughs> because, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I just don't... Uh, and also, I, I think there's something to be said for admitting that we cannot do it alone. But if you want this spiritual insight, if you want the Gaian matrix to welcome you, then humble yourself to the point of making a deal with a plant. That's the key. You can't enter the bank without the key to the bank. The key to the bank is a plant. Jumping up and down outside the bank and exhorting the banker to recognize your inner worth and open the door is just not, uh, not going to do it. I can understand that psychoactive alkaloids are a survival mechanism for the plants. Why is that effect psychoactive in man or perhaps animal? Um, well, first of all, maybe we have to argue with your premise. You're right that a lot of these so-called secondary and tertiary compounds are elaborated supposedly to make things taste bad or so that birds and will spit out things and stuff like that. Uh, but on the other hand, they've studied this question fairly closely and a lot of these alkaloids are produced specifically to attract animals, to bring them in to nectaries and as pollinators and that sort of thing. Uh, 
old style botany always believes these compounds are what's called tertiary to metabolism, meaning they're kind of like waste products and not very important garbage. But when you look carefully at a psychoactive plant, invariably what you see is that the psychoactive chemistry is going on where metabolism is most active. This is an indication that actually these things aren't tertiary at all. They are doing something for the plant, but we don't know what it is. As to why they have this peculiar effect that they do in us, uh, I think that's because there was anciently and over the evolutionary life of human beings actually a connection between us and nature and uh, that these, these drugs are the antenna, the switches that switch us back toward the logos of, uh, of the natural world. I suspect that all of nature is a seamless web of pheromonally mediated connections and interactions and that we are just not yet at a sufficient level of analysis and sophisticated observation to see this interconnected web. You know, our idea of nature is that it's all tooth and claw, survival of the fittest and the devil take the hindmost. The new version of evolution is entirely different. It says the way you attain survival is by making yourself indispensable to everybody else. So it's not by triumphing over the ecosystem, but by integrating yourself so thoroughly into it that it can't function without you. Then you're on your way to being a dominant uh, species, not by crushing the opposition. Uh, let's see how we're doing here. What are deconstructionists doing to our understanding of the language? Is it helpful? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> By deconstructionists, I suppose uh, you mean uh, Jacques Derrida and uh, that crowd. Well, I think deconstruction serves a very useful function. I think we are unaware of, uh, of what, how thoroughly language is the medium in which we swim, how thoroughly our world is built of language. In a way, the boundary dissolving character of the plant hallucinogens is a dissolving of language barriers. They show you that the surface of reality was not the surface of reality, it was the surface of your local language. And now it's gone, and, uh, and here is uh, what lies beneath it. At what point in the evolution of organic matter on Earth do psychoactive plants appear and why? Interesting question. If we're talking about psychoactive fungi, we're severely limited by the fossil record because no fossil mushroom has ever been found older than 40 million years. This is because fossil mushrooms are very soft-bodied, ephemeral kind of things as primary decomposers, which is what fungi are doing on this earth, it's reasonable to assume that they must have been here from the very beginning of the conquest uh, of the land, but proof in the fossil record has not been forthcoming. Now, if we're talking about higher plants, flowering plants, which is mostly what we're talking about here, then no flowering plants existed before 65 million years ago. Flowering plants emerged out of the same catastrophe that destroyed the dinosaurs and set the stage for the emergence of the mammals. This is something people don't realize. Flowering plants are as recent as mammals. You know, if you look at the, if the period of life on Earth is visualized as a yardstick, the period of the flowering plants is the last inch and a half. And it's also the, the rise of the mammals occurs in that last inch and a half. So before that, the plant life on the earth was of a very uh, different sort, and we know nothing about its chemistry. Here's someone who asked a Zen question. <laughs> What would make the present government interested in the study of psychedelics? 
I don't know if they could make a buck out of it. Uh, I, I don't think they're very interested in psychedelics. I don't think any political... What? CIA, they were very interested in psychedelics. Except that they abandoned it. Yes, MKUltra, for those of you who don't know, stands for mind control, spelled the southern way. Mind control ultra was a program the CIA pursued in the 1960s where they tried out all kinds of psychedelic drugs and they also worked it with it in combination with hypnosis. They were trying to make what they called the Trojan horse this was somebody who would be an assassin but not even know it. And uh, how far they got with all of this we will never know because of course it all disappears behind the walls of secrecy. But the declassified history of the CIA and LSD is very interesting. Some of you may know the book Acid Dreams by, uh, by uh, Martin Lee. Uh, fascinating history of the way the government tried and really failed, I think, to use psychedelics. The, the government's initial approach to LSD was, uh, this is great, this is a truth serum, we can give this to enemy agents and they'll tell us all we know. Well, a few months of following that path, they decided, no. <laughs> This is an obscurity drug. We can give this to our agents and they can take it if they're captured and no one can learn anything from it. <laughs> and, you know, clearly this was not a fruitful path either. And I, I really, I don't fault the government, I don't really fault the government for this. After all, the government is in the business of being the government. I don't think any institution can inculcate psychedelics into its own program because psychedelics destroy institutions, all institutions. I mean, it's like trying to move an acid around that corrodes whatever pipes you pour it through. And uh, because the boundary dissolving quality of psychedelics is precisely the quality that government is involved in resisting. Government builds up labels, hands out role models, explains how everything is, and this stuff just then melts that back into a primal chaos. So it's pretty corrosive of any social values that don't arise spontaneously out of biological organization. It's anarchist. Uh, it, it, it's the acid of anarchy in a way. All right, we're never going to get through this list, but it's gratifying to know it's here if we need it. <laughs> here's, a th here's a question about the time wave, which I'm going to skip because we're not talking about the time wave today, and pity the poor soul who's never heard of it. <laughs> know of any herbal sources to raise serotonin as a treatment for depression? Uh, no, I'm not, uh, I don't uh, know a lot about herbal medicine and that sort of thing, but uh, raising serotonin level as a treatment for depression seems like a pretty good strategy. Uh, I don't know of herbs. Usually inhibition of serotonin is what's going on. And with these psychedelics, they do compete with serotonin for the bond site. That's what the that's what it's all about at the atomic level, is in your synaptic cleft, in the synaptic clefts of your neurons, there are uh, what are called receptors. And if you were to fly down and look at these things, they look like complex locks. they are hooks, protuberances, little drawers, and fit in places. Well, then the drug molecule Comes, is carried into the synaptic cleft by the bloodstream and it seeks to what's called occupy the bond site or simply bond and it's trying to fit in. Well, the normal thing which fits in those bonding sites is serotonin, but some of these hallucinogens are much better fits 
than natural serotonin. They are what pharmacologists say competitive at the bond site. And so they literally elbow the, the serotonin out of the way. And then they fit themselves into the receptor. Well, once the receptor and its, uh, its fit, its agonist, are in place, then the biodynamic, the bioelectric uh, field of the synapse can be activated. Well, if you swap out serotonin for an exotic molecule like uh, harmine or mescaline or something like that, well then this shifts the mode of this uh, molecular level electrical environment. And I believe that that is what then registers as a higher cortical experience that we call the trip. It's the experience of hundreds of millions of these introduced molecules displacing the normal serotonin and then broadcasting this signal in a slightly different way than it is normally uh, perceived. So there's a molecular connection. There's a connection down into the molecular level. This will be our last one this morning. A language transcendence. Huxley, Jung, and others often mention liberating and enlightening liberating and enlightening epiphanies as beyond language and iconic imagery. You yourself mention this. Can you explain further the use of transcendental language? Yeah, and we might talk about that a little this afternoon. Um, I sort of alluded to it this morning. My idea is that language is a process that is half completed in us as we sit here and that language is really something which wants to be seen, not heard, but that we are on our way to evolving toward this visible language. And we currently are operating with these somewhat substandard acoustical codes. And I think in a way, history is the process of getting out, revealing, defining, refining uh, this natural language. The place where the psychedelics impact upon us as social creatures is the language domain. I mean, you may have tremendous hierophanies and breakthroughs, but if you can't talk about it, or paint about it, or dance about it, or in any way communicate it to anybody, then it is not efficacious for the species. It's just your uh, private entertainment. So the domain of language is where the collective impact is coming. And one of the things I think about psychedelics is that they are probably capable of helping us force the evolution of language. Because we cannot move into the future any faster than our uh, language of description for the future. So if we're interested in streamlining culture, and getting away from this sort of random walk style of cultural evolution, then we have to look at rationally uh, interfacing with the evolution of language. And maybe we can talk about that uh, when we come back. Thanks very much. We discussed basically the distribution of these psychoactive plants with a history of shamanic use and then discussed a little bit about the history of them. And I didn't really finish with that uh, because I want to stress uh, that this, I think what we talked about this morning is we got them all to a good place. We got them all to paradise in Africa with clear vision, much food, and plenty of horsing around. And then we broke for, for lunch. Uh, the forces that created that partnership society in prehistory, the forces that allowed the emergence of a non-male dominant social style, were the same forces which then eventually destroyed it as well, because it was nothing more than uh, climatological change is what was happening. Uh, as the African continent became drier, 
uh, the grasslands retreated, the water holes became less frequent and further apart, and the mushroom came under pressure because of increased dryness. And at that point, I think probably uh, the mushroom festivals became less and less frequent. The whole thing became more tenuous and there was great pressure then to try and figure out how to preserve the mushrooms through the dry times of the year to have them available for ceremonies. And I think that uh, it's the, uh, the use of honey as a preservative that uh, really set the stage for things to go wrong because honey um, turns into a psychedelic compound on its own if you do nothing to it but leave it alone. It ferments, it becomes mead, and mead is a primitive kind of alcoholic beverage. So over several millennia, what began as a, an ecstatic mushroom cult turned into a beer cult, a cult of alcoholic intoxication. And then you get the same shift of ratios that you see in our own society. I mean, how many women in our own society have their first sexual experiences in an atmosphere of alcohol abuse and misuse? The two almost go together, and less in the 20th century. And before the 20th century, it's almost possible to imagine nobody got laid for a thousand years in the West without being pretty juiced up because it was pretty unappetizing, I imagine. So uh, this is a way in which uh, sensory modalities and emphasis on different aspects of psyche change over time uh, without a culture even being aware of it. And then I talked this morning a little bit about the, the fall into history, the neurotic dysfunctionalism that characterizes historical existence. And I think it's worth going back to that because some people have the idea that psychedelics are a kind of instant psychotherapy and that they address the concerns of the individual, but they're not concerned to link it up to history, to see what it was for us in the past and what its absence has done for us. I think that the whole phenomenon that we call the fall into history is the uh, uh, scenario of abandonment that we underwent as we broke the umbilical connection to the Gaian matrix of organic life. That's what we were um, embedded in in this African context. But when, we, when Africa dried up and we moved out of Africa and into the Middle East, we then were transformed from nomadic pastoralists into primitive agriculturalists and then later city builders, and the entire pattern of male dominance and anxiety is set in place. If you look at the world of 7000 BC, the most, uh, the most sophisticated human structure on the earth of, let's say, 7500 BC is at Jericho in what is now Palestine. And it, what is it? It's a grain storage tower built at Jericho, 7275 BC. Uh, it indicates that the primitive pastoral nomadic form has given way now to an agricultural form that uh, allows for the accumulation of surplus and hence the need to defend same and hence the establishment of a uh, have and have not psychology and so forth and so on. So all of the institutions 
that we now must attempt to reform and grapple with began then. Uh, urbanization, kingship, male dominance, representative politics, all of these things uh, begin then and are further exacerbated a couple or three thousand years later by the Western decision to go with a phonetic alphabet as a method of communication. See, a phonetic alphabet further removes you away from anything uh, uh, concrete or real or related to nature. There's no ideogram, there's no glyph, there isn't even a rebus. There is simply an abstract symbol which stands for a sound. I mean, this is about as far away from the hands-on approach of of language that you could get. Well, the culture that made these decisions, which is our culture, the culture of Europe and the ancient Middle East, has evolved into the dominant culture on the planet and has put in place institutions like science and so forth and so on. Our metaphors have grown ever more cogent in their ability to manipulate matter and energy as they have evolved less and less relevance to ourselves. So now we have ideological systems of tremendous power that none of us can understand or relate to, which is a kind of an odd relationship to knowledge, since knowledge is supposed to be an experience of empowerment, not an experience of disempowerment. But our society has done it differently. And so we all wander around with a sense of disempowerment because we're surrounded by accomplishments that we couldn't possibly duplicate. Well, I mention all this because I think that it shows where the solution lies. If we were in balance 15,000 years ago and it was achieved through the use of psychedelics de-emphasis of the ego, non-existence of the nuclear family, and the suppression of the concept of ownership, we should look at these as possible styles of existence that might be put in place in, uh, in the future. That's this psychedelic society that you've heard me talk about at various times. Well, that's probably enough on that. Well, you thought so too. <laughs> when I said we'd look at the geographical distribution, the history, and then the phenomenology, I thought that we would put most of the phenomenology of the thing in here, in this section, because it, it's important to establish just what we're talking about, and also to empower people to describe their own experiences, which are often so peculiar that unless there is a group such as this, a person tends to just define themselves as starkers. I mean, what else can you say about some of this? But, you know, if you're starkers and you get ten people to agree with you, you're not starkers anymore, you're a movement. <laughs> <coughs> So I mentioned this morning about it, DMT and I made of it the kind of paradigmatic compound because it's so brief, so natural, so powerful, so quick to recover from. And, uh, and it's also a very good paradigmatic case when talking about what the psychedelic experience is like to have because I think if you have the DMT experience on the way to the center of that flash, you'll probably have all the other ones. Uh, it seems to lie at the center of the mandala. The most startling thing about the DMT flash, and I mentioned this this morning when we were talking about Jung, is how astonishing it is that death by astonishment seems the major danger. And this is even if you're an art historian, a Jungian, an aficionado of symbols and so forth and so on. It seems to come from some dimension orthogonal 
to uh, the human world. And it is not a unitary experience, the way the famous white light and all these other wordless, indescribable, elusive, mercurial things are. It isn't like that at all. It's, uh, it's extremely multiplistic and it's extremely specific in its, imp in its presentation. And when you smoke DMT, you have the feeling that you have burst into a place that you have not had a psychological experience, you are not having a mental experience, you have burst into some kind of a space. And within that space, um, there, the first shock is that it's inhabited. And this is the shock I've never recovered from, because it was just the last thing I expected to find inside a chemical compound was the equivalent of a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Uh, it is inhabited by um, entities, is the only word to describe them. And they are, as I've said many times, they are like jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs. And there are many of them. And they come out of the background and they present themselves to you. They're literally vibrating up and down with excitement. They're faceted and rotating. And they see you as clearly as you see them. They even uh, greet you. Some of you may recall the Pink Floyd, the old Pink Floyd song, The Gnomes Have Learned a New Way to Say Hooray. <laughs> I think it's on Piper at the Gates of Dawn. It's the first album those Floyd fans were looking puzzled. It's because it was 40 years ago or something. A anyway, as you burst into this space, the gnomes say, Hooray! And they present themselves, and they are, the tr they are truly the gnomes of, uh, of Central European fairy tales, archetypal, Gnomes. They are. Uh, they're very humorous. They're very uh, mercurial and delightful. But I think it's Jung warns against the humor of the spirit Mercurius, because it can turn on you. It's not a friendly humor. It's too crazy. Too many plates are being thrown. Too many cars are exploding. It's like a Marx Brothers cartoon that hovers just on the edge of changing from mayhem to mania, you know? Very intense. And the most striking thing to me, and really the motivation for my career, is they are displaying um, new models of language that have never been seen before. They sing, and out of their singing elfin chatter condense objects which look like nothing at all in this world. I mean, the closest I've been able to come to them are the, Fabrig the eggs of Fabergé, you know, these constructs in sapphire and ivory and crystal and vitreous glass that uh, the French designer Fabergé created. Well, these things are like that, but they're like that raised to some excruciating pinnacle of completion because as they show you these objects, you know beyond any possibility of contravention that if a single one of these objects were to exist in this world, it would change this world forever. If a single one of these objects were to exist in this world, we would spend a thousand years studying this object. The last time this happened was a guy gave a speech up on a hill about moral obligation. We studied it for a thousand years. Um, this is the same kind of thing. And these Fabergé hyperdimensional objects are themselves undergoing a dynamic transformation. They're not static objects like the Fabergé eggs. They are undergoing changes, singing, 
condensing other objects. These objects are crawling all over the ground in front of you, clamoring for your attention. Now remember, 12 seconds before you were sitting in a suburban living room somewhere grappling with some drug somebody wanted you to take. Now all that's gone. And here are these things. I call them tykes because I wanted to capture the sense of their childlikeness. I don't know why I called them tykes, actually. It just seemed like the appropriate thing. If some of you are classicists or students of the literature of the pre-Socratic philosophers, you might recall the 52nd fragment of Heraclitus, which says, uh, the aeon is a child at play with colored balls. The aeon is a child at play with colored balls. And when you break your way into the presence of the aeon, it's extremely, con um, I don't know, it's upsetting. You can't believe it's happening. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance. You could believe this if it just weren't happening to you. <laughs> and there is this tremendous affection and interest in humanity and then there is urgency, a lot of urgency. The tykes want to initiate you. They have a message. And the message is, you can do what we are doing. And what they're doing is using their voices to make physical objects condense out of the air. And they're saying, you can do this. Do it. Do it. Do it! And they're on you. And they, they jump in and out of your chest, which is something that is described in the Amazon, too. The hikuli in the tryptamine snuff cults of the Yanomama. Uh, the, they jump in and out of your chest. And they are saying, do this thing. Do it. Do it. Suspend your belief. And eventually, you do do it. You You discover that you can drop the filter of meaning, that your voice can move back several registers, and out comes elf chatter. And this elf chatter is able to wring the air in front of you like a washcloth and get alchemical gold to drip out of the air and to begin to condense in front of you. Well, at this, by this time, most people would like to call time out <laughs> so they can make phone calls to various philosophers. <laughs> but there is no time out. It, it just keeps going. Uh, and these things have a, a very, the aura of strangeness of alienness is palpable. There's an emotion in there that we just don't have in this world because it's composed of unbelievable alienness in the presence of unbe unbelievable familiarity. It's, a, it's a, an ecstasy that is a coincidencia oppositorum. Simultaneously, it is both what it is and what it is not. And the human mind can't handle that. That's called cognitive dissonance. I mean, you just go into a, a conniption fit of some sort. Well, the very first time I smoked DMT in, in 1967, with absolutely no expectation, this happened to me. And it has happened every time since. And then I've had occasion to observe people taking DMT uh, in countries where it's legal. And what I see is there is an archetype which surrounds DMT, which you must make your way through it. But at the center of the archetype, the archetype is not present and only the alien is present. The archetype is that of the circus or the carnival the carnival. Think for a moment about the carnival. It has two aspects. One is blazing light and activity at the center of the triple ring. The lady in the spangled costume is high above the main floor and the lions and the tigers and the clowns are parading around. That's part of it. But it has another aspect just off to the side of the big tent, there are the sideshows, 
the Hoochie Coochie dancers, the two-headed man, and so forth and so on. In other words, there's this kinky, peculiar, shadow side of it. And I often, uh, if any of you are fans of the film of Federico Fellini, here is a man who understood the archetype of the circus and how, in, uh, if you remember in Amarcord, that circus, or if you remember in Giulietta di Spiri, the, the flaming doorway into the room with the bed, with the bed springs and the crate paper flames. These are carnival, carnival images that relate back uh, to DMT. When you finally come into the center of it, these are all seen to be veils. It, it veils itself that way because that's how you... Uh, it's the old candy to the baby routine. It treats us as people who would like to go to the circus. And then it takes us to the circus. But then there is a revelation beyond that. And I, I don't know how many people present in this room have confronted the thing I'm talking about. I always, at this moment, am aware that some people are saying, my, doesn't he perfectly get it? And other people are saying, huh? What is this? What is this guy talking about? The point I want to make is it's real. It's not vague. You don't have to strain for it. Nobody wonders whether or not it happened to them. It's just like somebody walking up to you and taking you by the arm and saying, there's something I insist on showing you. Come this way, please. <laughs> And I am very, it was the presence of the entities that shattered the person who I was because I was a scientific rationalist, a reductionist. I had no, no room for elves in my cosmology. <laughs> and here they were, hundreds of them. So it seems to me that this is a central question that shamanism has always dealt with perhaps not with the kind of ontological sophistication that we imagine ourselves to have, but this is the question that must be asked. Who's in there? Who is this? There are at least three possibilities. And I'm not sure which is the most conservative. The first possibility is that um, we don't understand how the world is constructed. And that, in fact, there is a parallel universe running alongside of ours uh, full of elves who use a language to make objects. And then why you can burst through to this place on this one drug, you know, then that raises, each explanation raises a lot of questions. Uh, then the other possibility is, uh, um, this is the Jungian possibility. And Jung, in, uh, I can't remember which one it was, but one of the later things, he talks about these elves because of the Kibiri. The Kibiri are the alchemical children that appear in Act 3 of Faust that Jung spent a lot of time on these alchemical Kibiri and the question of the homunculus. And uh, he says at one place, I think he says, uh, uh, he describes them as autonomous psychic elements that have escaped from the control of the ego. This is a weird way to go about it. I mean, it's probably an accurate description, but how much does it tell us, you know? It means that the psyche is to be visualized as a half gallon of mercury, and when we throw it on the floor, the mercury balls up and spreads everywhere. And each ball of mercury you look at, by, by gad, it has a little face looking back at you. <laughs> That's because mercury is a mirrored surface. You're looking at your own psyche shattered into thousands of, of pieces around you. Another possibility, and one I leaned toward for years, and I still lean toward 
because I've noticed the radical nature of your explanation uh, diminishes with the distance since the last time you smoked a DMT. Uh, the longer it's been, the more likely you are to have some humdrum notion that you can pour it into. So the humdrum notion that I settled on was, well, clearly these are just extraterrestrials. <laughs> this is, they don't come in silver ships demanding to be taken to the National Defense Agency. <laughs> this is how they come. Why they come this way, who knows? They're coming through mind. Mind is the medium in which they travel. Where do they come from? Who knows? Can it even be located in the Newtonian space-time matrix? I mean, what do you want here? A star catalog number? Would that satisfy you? Uh, and then finally, and I think I've exceeded my number of possible explanations. Um, <laughs> and then finally, the explanation, which is my current favorite, it dis it's a little disturbing. Um, and I haven't quite figured out what to do with it, but I have a sense we're on the right track here. The reason the DMT space feels so peculiar, both alien and excruciatingly uh, uh, familiar, is uh, because these things in this other place represent what I call an ecology of souls. This place is the one place you never thought you were going to make a visit to and come back to chat it around the coffee maker. This, they're dead. That's who these things are. This is the realm of the dead. Well, I have to confess, in all of my psychedelic voyaging and idea mongering and all of that, I never was able to go that far, to reach that far in my imagination. It sort of had to be presented to me. But if you go to shamans worldwide and talk to them about their spirit helpers and say, you know, what's the deal with this? You know, who are these things? And they say, well, these are the ancestors. Didn't you know? These are the ancestors. It's perfectly cut and dried and normal. Uh, I, I had occasion, I won't use his name to embarrass him, but I had occasion to expose a very well-known Tibetan high mucky muck to uh, a DMT. And he said after, he took it like a man, said afterwards, that is the lesser lights. That is the lesser lights. And if any of you are students of Mahayana Buddhism, you know that the lesser lights are the lights you see at the edge of the bardo as you start into the 42-day process of dying. You encounter the lesser lights. This guy was saying to me, you cannot go further in the, in the body and have any expectation of returning. In other words, once you see the lesser lights, you have stretched the umbilicus to matter to the breaking point. If you go one step further, it's eternity for you. Well, I don't know how I feel about this. The, the head tyke, I've had to then ask myself, the head tyke, is that me? Do you actually encounter your dead soul? Is there a dimension where you are both simultaneously dead and alive, both simultaneously witness and observer? Um, I don't know, but I certainly think that if we're going to use a conservative explanation for these things, the only, con the only theory more conservative than that they are dead people is the theory that says that they are nothing whatsoever, and that just simply will not serve. I think it would come as a tremendous surprise to 20th century uh, civilization if orthogonal to all our expectations of space flight and virtual reality and all this techno schmechno stuff that we're lining up in front of us, there would be a broadside from 90 degrees out of the unexpected, and it would be a doorway swinging open into the realms beyond organic existence. I resisted this fiercely, 
but I just don't know what we're going to do with these DMT creatures if we don't, uh, you know, try to find a rational explanation. And the any rational explanation will be exotic because the facts of the matter are exotic. Those of you who have not had this experience, who are sitting there thinking it would never happen to me, you're full of it. <laughs> it will happen to you. This, isn't, this doesn't require the willful suspension of disbelief. This doesn't require a pure heart or dietary prescription. No, this is part of the human birthright. And the fact that we deny the existence of a non-human entity, intellect, intelligence on this planet, is just part of our heritage from rationalism. And, you know, you don't have to take it very seriously because rationalism, the philosophy that gives us permission to deny the invisible world, you know who founded the philosophy of rational materialism? Any takers? Aristotle was early. I think I'd give credit to René Descartes for modern materialism and rationalism. Well, uh, you know who told René Descartes to found rationalism and materialism? An angel. Are you ready for this? This is a suppressed, this is a suppressed history episode in the history of human thought. Here are the facts, folks. 1619, René Descartes is 21 years old. He's a young Frenchman in search of adventure. He joins a Habsburg army that is going off to Prague to lay siege to Prague to put down an alchemical revolt there. They kick butt on these alchemists, win the war, and they're on their way back to France. And in September 1619, this French army camped at Ulm in southern Germany. Some of you may know Ulm as Einstein's hometown. And in fact, that figures in our story obliquely, as you will see. <laughs> This French army camps at Ulm, and uh, René Descartes hits the hay, and in the middle of the night, an angel appears to this young man in the radiance of his rooms and says, the mastery of nature is to be achieved through number and measure. Modern science is founded, folks, right there, right then, by an angel. So how, you know, how far away are the informing voices? Uh, how, how rational is rationalism? How material is materialism? Uh, all of you must know, I'm sure, the famous story of Kekulé, the, the German chemist Kekulé, who discovered the benzene ring. He, he was uh, struggling with this problem in physical chemi chemistry, could not figure it out, fell asleep in his study, and the Ouroboric serpent appeared before him in his dream and took its tail in its mouth. And he came out of a sound sleep and said, I've got it. He walked to the blackboard. He drew the first benzene ring. Angelic intervention. Intervention uh, from the unconscious. So I, my... The point of all this is to suggest that human history is completely interpenetrated by the peculiar, the non-human, that which has intentionality and affection for mankind, for humanity. And this is what shamans call to their aid. This is how the curing is done. It's done through these spirit helpers they're called, elementals. And um, so far as I know, Jungianism is the only modern intellectual position where you can even raise this issue without having a net dropped over you. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is absolutely forbidden by the modern worldview. Uh, and yet it lies very, very close 
to the surface in our culture. I mean, as an example of how close to the surface it lies in our culture, consider for a moment um, Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. What's this about? Santa Claus is the master of the elves. The elves that he is master of are demon artificers. They make toys for the world's children in their vast underground toy shops. And where are these underground toy shops? At the North Pole. I don't have to tell a room full of Jungians that the North Pole is the Axis Mundi, Yggdrasil, the magic world ash, the center of uh, the mandala. What are the colors of Santa Claus? Red and white, the colors of Amanita muscaria, absolutely. What is the titulary animal of Santa Claus? Reindeer. Reindeer are very central to the Amanita muscaria cult because reindeer uh, eat the mushroom and then excrete their urine and this is thought to be a cleaner and easier way to take the mushroom than to take it on the so-called first pass. The second pass is after the reindeer have had it. Uh, you know, just an anecdotal aside, if you're ever in the Yakut Basin, one of the great perils of the intoxicated Amanita user is to crawl out of the yurt in the middle of the night to take a leak in the snow, and before you can back off, the reindeer come and knock you headlong because they want to get to this Amanita-flavored snow. So, here is Santa Claus right in the center of our culture and when you take it apart all the motifs are there the demon artificers the elves the cosmic axis uh, the magical flight I mean it's a beautiful example of the preservation of pagan uh, psychedelic use into uh, a modern context well, what can we say about this? <laughs> oh, well, I know. The one thing, one more thing I wanted to say about it. The, this program that these tykes are pushing is a language skills program. And we don't know how long people have been bursting into this place. This may be the source of language, you know, how did, where did language come from? We learned it from elves in hyperspace is as, <laughs> as good a, uh, a possibility as uh, any other. And this is still ongoing, this language reformation program. They want us to activate our language forming ability. And language in the DMT flash, as I said this morning, it's something beheld. Syntax is something potentially to be looked at, not to be heard. And we don't understand this because for us, language is something that you hear. We can't imagine a language that you see. But have you ever noticed the way in which we preserve clarity of intention in language with verbal metaphors. We say, I see what you mean. He painted a picture. It means we unconsciously believe that truth will be beheld. And some of you who are students of the ancient literature may know uh, Philo Judaeus, uh, Hellenistic, Alexandrine Jew, absolute contemporary of Christ, born before, died after. And in one of his uh, treatises on the Logos, which he was always talking about, uh, Philo Judaeus uh, presents an etymology of the word Israel, talking about the word Israel, and he says Israel means he who sees God. This is the meaning of the word Israel. And then he goes on to say uh, this he who sees God. He's talking about that, and he says what would be the more perfect Logos? Now, I should assume most of you know the Logos was an informing voice, a voice in the head 
which was the sine qua non of Alexandrian spirituality. Uh, Socrates had it, Plato had it, the Logos. So Philo Judaeus asks, what would be the more perfect Logos? And then he answers his own question. He says, the more, per the more perfect Logos would go from being beheld, I'm sorry, would go from being heard to being beheld without ever crossing over a noticeable moment of transition. Well, that is precisely what you encounter in deep psychedelic experiences and the DMT flash. You behold the Logos. In the, in the initiation of the experience, you don't behold it. You hear it. It sounds, in Michael Harner's wonderful phrase, like the sound of rushing water or like the sound of tinkling bells and it's very far away and then it begins to come closer you can you can you begin to form a picture of it in your mind the way you would form a picture of a Nepali marching band if you just heard it about a half mile away and the um pa pa and it's getting bigger coming closer th this is the elf parade and when it finally comes into view, it actually goes, without ever passing over a noticeable moment of transition, from being heard to being seen through the phenomenon of approach. You hear it before you see it, then you see it far away, then you see it very close, and when you see it very close, who cares what it sounds like because you're seeing it. This more perfect logos is what the tykes, the spiritual helpers, want to teach. And I think that it's important to spend a little time on this because I think this would have tremendous historical impact upon our situation if we could, by hook or by crook, create a, uh, a more visible logos, a language which could be seen. You've probably all considered at some time or another what would telepathy be like? And I think most people answer that question by thinking that telepathy would be for me to hear what you think. But how would it be if telepathy were for me to see what you mean? That's telepathy. If it puts you in the other guy's shoes, if you stand in the other person's shoes, you are the other person. To have a person's point of view is to be that person in regard to that single uh, uh, datum of experience. So I've spent time with virtual reality people and all these technical folks because I think that vir visual language is something that wants to be born. And it may be that it is can be technologically coaxed into existence, that we're going to have to wear goggles and have fast computer, or it may be that it can be physiologically coaxed into existence. There may be drugs which shift the processing of language from being an auditory phenomenon to being a visible phenomenon. Ayahuasca is an excellent candidate for this. Uh, if you spend time with the ayahuasca-taking populations in the Amazon, there's great stress in these populations on acquiring what's called an ikaro. Ikaro means magical song, and the ikaro is a spontaneous chant-like song which comes to you during the intoxication. The thing that's interesting about these ikaros is that they are critiqued as visual objects, not as sound. People never say of an Icaro, it sounded beautiful. They always say, it looked lovely. And then people will say, but there should have been more blue. <laughs> this kind of thing, it's clearly being criticized as a visual modality. Well, I think that these ayahuasca using people are at the cutting edge of evolution. They are forcing they are forcing the evolution of the modality of 
language. It m may be that the processing of language is not hardwired, not physiologically wired. It's a software function having to do with culture, language, upbringing, and so forth. Because some people claim they are great visualizers and that they do think visually and so forth. And we have no reason to deny this. So it may be that we are just a one gene or even a, an expression of gene ratios difference away from an entirely different way of processing communication between each other. And this is what the new age, the end of history, the anticipation of this great breakthrough that we can feel but not really outline is about. If that seems far-fetched to you, you should notice how far-fetched the original emergence of language must have been. Because I think people were fully people and, full and totally mute or, you know, unable to articulate a thought. And then, either an accumulation of neurons or some synergistic effect was brought into play, and lo and behold, spoken language emerged out of that. Well, something similar could happen to us. In the morning session, I talked about um, the forced evolution of language, paying attention to our language. I really think that the way to think of these psychedelics is as catalysts for the imagination. Uh, if any of you are chemists, you know a catalyst is something that when you add it to a chemical process, the process is tremendously speeded up, but in the end the catalyst is not destroyed. The catalyst is reconstituted at the end. So psychedelics, one way of thinking of them, is as a catalyst for cognition. The original description of psychedelic drugs was they were consciousness expanding drugs. Well, if we take the idea that they are consciousness expanding seriously for even a moment, then we have to put a lot of attention in on this because it's the absence of consciousness that is murdering us and our planet. We need all the consciousness we can get. We need to wring it out of computers, get it out of plants, raise it in ourselves and our children. Uh, wherever we can get it, uh, we need it. And the present, uh, you know, the present situation with the planet is very dire, very dire because of us. Our unchecked evolution in a single direction along the gradient of culture has now created a toxic planet that is an endangered planet. Uh, since this situation has arisen entirely within the confines of history, aren't we going to have to look outside of history in order to redress this problem? I think so. And when we do look outside history, then we find the institution of plant shamanism there waiting to inform us, to educate us, and to show us how to set our, uh, uh, a course out of the present dilemma. I don't think we can find our way out by ourselves. I don't think we can get high by ourselves, and I don't think as a species that we can save this planet by ourselves. We have to have a partner. We have to uh, get an ally into this situation. Um, just in closing and as an example, the mushroom has a tremendous problem-solving ability. And because we can talk to it, we can ask it questions. We can actually get a non-human perspective on human problems. A few weeks ago, I made this statement before a group of people somewhere, and after the talk was over, somebody came up to me and said, well, so why don't you ask the mushroom how to save the world? And I just put it off, thought it was the wrong attitude, 
But then later I wondered about this question, how to save the world, and, and I thought, well, maybe I've been too circumspect with the mushroom. Maybe I should just put it to it. <laughs> so I carried out the experiment and put to them, how do we save the world? And now I don't offer this as the solution. I'm going to tell you the mushroom's answer so that you can see how our backs aren't quite to the wall yet. There are still avenues to be explored. I said to the mushroom, how can we save the world? There was a hesitation of one third of a second approximately. And then the mushroom said, no woman should raise more than one natural child. And I said, what? He said, no woman should raise more than one natural child. So I took that home with me and I thought about it. Uh, here are the consequences of following that piece of advice. Uh, the population of the earth would be cut in half in 50 years. Fifty years following that, it would be cut in half again. Fifty years after that, in half again. In 150 years, the population of the earth could be under a billion people. Nobody was shot. No wars were fought. No one was told they could not have a child. No one was coerced. No one was starved. Um, then I started looking into this. Thing about children and population. And most of you, like me, probably imagine that the world has a population problem. And this population problem is going on in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh because dag nabbit, those little brown people will just not stop having children. Well, I looked into it and I've got a surprise for you. An Ameri a child born in America will use between 600 and 1,000 times more natural resources and energy than a child born to a woman in Bangladesh. Suppose you went to Bangladesh and you met a woman, a young woman of childbearing age, and she told you that uh, her ambition in life was to have a thousand children you'd be appalled. I mean, what kind of social responsibility is this? What kind of person are you that you want to do this? An American woman having one child is having the equivalent of those thousand infants. Now, an in another interesting thing about this suggestion made by the mushroom, that each woman should rear one natural child. When we think of population control schemes, the first objection is, my God, you can never sell this to people. They have these religions, they have these centuries of tradition and so forth. It just won't wash. Notice that what the mushroom suggested is most likely to be accepted by the person most important to convert. We don't want to convert the women of the back streets of Bangladesh to this policy. We want to convert the women of Sherman Oaks. Malibu, Santa Monica, Gross Point, Boston, New York, Philadelphia. Because these are the women whose children are using the resources. So here is, in one sentence, the mushroom was able to answer a question I put to it with a suggestion I had never dreamed of, that seems at first glance anyway, to stand up pretty well. And I've spent a lifetime trying to figure out ways to solve human problems. See, we're a little stupid because we're all alike. And something years ago the mushroom said to me, which deals with this, was uh, people are always uh, this question of enlightenment. And the mushroom said, for one human being to expect to obtain enlightenment from another is like a grain of sand on the beach expecting to attain enlightenment from another grain of sand on the beach. Don't you get it? You're all grains of sand. I mean, Joe Schmo, who runs a body shop, and Mukta Ruby Baba are the same people. They, there's no difference between those two guys. No reason to assume so. Uh, 
so I think we need help, and that little exercise in what do you do about the population problem shows that there are suggestions out there we haven't thought of, avenues we haven't tried. When I thought about why haven't we tried this avenue of one woman, one natural child, it took me right. about 30 seconds to understand that it's real hard to make a buck in a situation when population is uh, retracting at a rate of 50% per generation. And our whole world is based on making a buck. I told this idea to someone and they said, but if the women of Malibu stop having children, they will lose all their political power because political power is numerical. This is not true. Political power is power. And if the women of Malibu stop having children, they will be quite a bit wealthier than they already are. Notice that this deciding to voluntarily have one natural child is also very helpful to you personally. That uh, a, a woman will have to work less hard, will have to cut fewer deals with the in-place structure of male dominance if she has only one child. A woman with two children has got to cut a deal with male dominance or she has a trust fund or something. Uh, the reason we are, I think, instinct, we have a tendency to clench at this suggestion and not follow it through uh, is because we imagine that there is something holy and sacred about the nuclear family and that we don't want to attack this biological unit that has such integrity. But this is a bunch of nonsense. The nuclear family has no biological integrity whatsoever. It's a creation of the post-industrial reformation. The extended family is the natural human unit to ease the pressure of child rearing on young women and to give everybody the benefit of contact, intergenerational contact and so forth. No, this nuclear family that our politicians are always beating their breasts about is the absolute cauldron of neurosis in this society, as far as I can see. And when you look at the demographics of what is happening, the number of women with one, ch the number of households that are one woman, one child household, I think you can see that maybe our unconscious has already been in communication with the mushroom, and it's just the ego who's going to get the news uh, last. Well, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's an example of how these things offer solutions to human problems. And if it can offer solutions to a human problem like overpopulation by six billion people on a planet, then it can surely take care of the needs of, and concerns of a group of rainforest hunter-gatherers that number 70 or so people. I doubt they can conceive of a question that it doesn't have an answer to because it can operate uh, on many levels uh, simultaneously. And this is an example of consciousness in action. You see, me plus nothing had nothing new to say about the population problem. Me plus psilocybin had a whole new take, a suggestion. We can swat it down and ultimately decide it's a bunch of malarkey, but at least there was a new thought, a new try, a new hope. This is the consequences of consciousness. And we're beset by problems like this. And we shouldn't assume that they are insoluble simply because we haven't solved them. In fact, we must assume that they are soluble or else we are not going to have a place to hang our hat in 50 years, but we, the, the solutions come through an act of humility, an act of opening to the dynamic of nature, the feminine, the psyche. The ego is the calcareous knot of tumorous tissue that stands outside of all that and cannot be trusted and cannot be relied upon. Uh, and so by attempting to dissolve that, to, to mitigate its hard edges, to smooth it out into the greater context of being, then we really discover uh, what humanness is about because humanness is not something that can be encompassed from the point of view of the ego. That's why 
having created the ultimately egoistic society, we've created a society with so little humanity in it, you know? And uh, I see the psychedelics as a siren song calling us back to what is authentic, to what is real, and to what, instead of closing off our future options, begins to open them up so that we can see that, you know, uh, human beings are a part of the larger universal destiny, and we can comport ourselves with grace and dignity and make the world a better place than we found it, which is certainly not our record so far. But it's not too late. I mean, H.G. Wells called history a race between education and disaster. It's not mere coincidence, nor even mere synchronicity, that at this moment in time and space, with these tremendous crises bearing down upon us, that we have reached out to the archaic peoples with a new attitude, not an attitude of how can we enslave them, but how can we learn from them. My hope is that here in the final ticking of the clock of history, we are going to end our prodigal descent into the desert world of the ego and return with what we have learned the fruits of the prodigal journeying of the errant son, which is what history has been, return with the fruits of that prodigal wandering to the larger human family that waits on us in the rainforests, in the deserts, in the marshes, in the thorn forests of this planet. The archaic people are waiting for us to get on the train, and then the train will be able to depart but we have to awaken to our past and then we can set a course toward a meaningful future. That's the wrap, basically. So let me explain uh, something. The DMT flash is very brief. The mushroom experience is very long, hours. You can, if you are fortunate and took enough, on a psilocybin trip, you can work your way into a place which looks like a DMT flash but it will take you a couple of hours of breath control and sitting in darkness and paying attention to get to this place. So I wanted to make clear that for my money, these hallucinogens all pretty much lead into the same place, but the experience of psilocybin and DMT is very different, if only because one is tremendously gradual, although it may not seem like that when it's happening, but compared to DMT, it's very gradual. It unfolds over several hours, while the other, you know, you measure the DMT flash in hundreds of seconds. I mean, it is a flash, for sure. Okay. I'll just make my way through these, and we'll do as many as we have time for, and I guess we'll go till about four. A recent LA Times Magazine article on Mayan excavation made passing reference to hallucinogenic enemas. Any knowledge of such practice? Good question, and humorous. <laughs> uh, enemas were invented uh, by the New World Indians, strangely enough. They were, uh, it was a route of drug administration unknown to Roman or Greek medicine. The reason the people of the Amazon basin invented enemas, two reasons really. First of all, they had these very strong corrosive drugs that they wanted to find a route of administration for. Uh, and, and the second reason was they had rubber. The South American forests are the source of rubber. So they invented the first enema, 
the first hot water bottle and God knows what else. <laughs> Decency should probably not even inquire. Um, <clears throat> I've never, I've never taken a hallucinogenic enema, but in principle it may not be a bad idea with some things that are very uh, sickening or, or like that. If you do an enema, though, remember that you cut doses to one-third. You don't do a full dose that way or you'll leave a human-shaped hole in the roof. <laughs> <clears throat> Once the European contact began, enemas became just a fad in Europe, and they were even doing tobacco smoke enemas uh, at one point, which is really weird. Okay. Please explain, uh, I guess it says, propagation and appropriate dosage of beetle nuts and kava. I don't know too much about beetle nuts. That's Piper beetle. It's a vice throughout Southeast Asia. You probably all know the song from South Pacific, Bloody Mary's Chewing Beetle Nut. That, that's what that's about. Uh, kava, Kava Kava is um, uh, Piper methysticum. This is a plant that occurs throughout Oceania and Micronesia, and uh, has a very exotic chemistry, bisnoriangonine and norbeocysteine are the active principles. These two compounds are known otherwise only from a mushroom. Uh, kava is a kind of dreamy intoxicant. You feel, you don't feel like doing much, but you really enjoy just sitting there on the beach and it's soporific kind of it causes a bizarre condition which is called crocodilianism and crocodilianism is where your skin dries and cracks and migrates into little pyramidal shapes and uh, when captain cook landed in the hawaiian islands he was of course meeting the high mucky mucks of the hawaiian royalty he thought everybody had leprosy. He didn't know what kind of a hell he'd fallen into until they put it together. He said, no, no, these are the royal families. All of these people are suffering from kava addiction, crocodilianism. Uh, it's not pleasant tasting. It's not a pleasant high. But recently I was uh, in another state and I had an errand to go, I, a, a very chance errand carried me to the house of someone I didn't know and there on the table in this house was this huge bowl this carved Fijian kava bowl and I walked over and and looked at it and it was full of this milky creamy stuff and I stuck my finger in and I tasted it and uh, it was kava and I turned to the lady of the house I said what's the story and she said my husband was in the Peace Corps in Fiji. He loves this stuff. <laughs> and uh, I, so then I met him and talked to him about it. He said, I'm a chronic alcoholic. I can't touch a drink. I can't touch a drop, but I drink this and I love it. And I said, well, do you know about crocodilianism? And he, he said, oh, yes. And he lifted up his shirt and scratched his chest and a huge cloud of dandruff uh, arose. So. <laughs> Sometimes you never know. It's the people I hang out with. So, you know. <laughs> Could you ask the mushroom what we should do about George Bush? <laughs> I have hope for the man. He has such a botanically promising name. <laughs> the ones that I'm not reading aloud are the ones which seem to go to areas of my concern that I haven't addressed here today, so I don't carry you over into them. This is an important question. What is your view of introducing psychedelics uh, 
to children and the initiation of children into altered states. Uh, this is so controversial, so hot, that r other than reading the question, <laughs> I'm not sure what I could say. Uh, at the Bridge Conference at Stanford a few weeks ago, there was a woman's panel. Um, Kat was on it, Carolyn Garcia, uh, Cindy Palmer Horowitz, Nina Gravoy, some of the great psychedelic women. and. Uh, this is very important to discuss. Some of you may have read Odd John by Robert Bly, where he makes a tremendous case that fathers should provide initiatory experiences for their children. And, you know, we're not talking an overnight trout fishing trip here, <laughs> folks. Um, I, I think this definitely needs to be discussed. I'd be more comfortable with women discussing it because I think women are the caregivers and the child rearers uh, largely. But it's really a problem. I mean, it's a problem for us that we even do these things in a climate of legal intolerance. And then, you know, to put it on to our children, to make criminals of our children. You know, I mean, you can lose your children with a stunt like that. This is very touchy, and yet I see it as a First Amendment right. It's a, ma a matter of religious conviction. Uh, uh, and I don't know, my hope is that someday this religious conviction issue is going to collide right into the psychedelic issue, uh, because I do not see how we can live under a constitution that guarantees life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and say that psychedelic drugs are illegal. I mean, if the pursuit of happiness means anything, it must cover that. Now, I've had constitutional scholars explain to me that, well, no, you don't understand. Hamilton wanted it to say life, liberty, and the right to own property, <laughs> and Jefferson uh, objected so they decided they'd put in language that was meaningless, so they settled on the pursuit of happiness. But I say, let's take that meaningless language in the Constitution and turn it into the greatest social revolution that's ever been seen. Ch children and psychedelics. And here's a technical question that uh, is the, about mushroom media that we should spare the rest of you. Um, all three explanations of the tykes are interesting, but are interpretations of experience. What if your tykes are contemplations which are becoming as diversely as they see themselves? The self-reflection of intelligence contains all forms. Correct. But then why these forms and why so persistently? You know, to anybody who says something is everything devolves the obligation of explaining then why it appears to be specifically something. And uh, I've taken lots of psychedelic uh, compounds and I don't get tykes anywhere else. I think this is somehow specific uh, to the beast. Oh, this is an interesting, this is more a statement than a question. Quantum mechanics, especially the Schrodinger's cat experiment, show that we are simultaneously dead and alive, rather uh, uh, like a Kekulé resonant structure of the two. DMT creatures are consistent with contemporary science. Um, this is true. I mean, language is what divides. But what is divided is not divided. It simply is uh, appears divided through the convention of uh, language. I'm real uncomfortable with this death and DMT issue because I don't know quite what to do with it. It's a little, I like profundity, but even that seems like deeper water than I uh, wanted to get into. How does Ibogaine relate to MDMA in opening the heart? Well, this is a funny thing about compounds. Most, uh, most drugs, after their discovery in the process of entering 
uh, uh, general awareness undergo a phase in which they are the love drug. This happens. Marijuana has been the love drug. LSD has been the love drug. Psilocybin has been the love drug. A slightly different kind of love, but cocaine has been called the love drug. MDMA is called a heart-opening drug, and Ibogaine, as I talked about, and then I've had tremendous heart openings on other things not related to this. And, and even DMT sends you down with an acute perception and appreciation of what a wonderful thing it is to be alive. Uh, chemically, MDMA doesn't relate to Ibogaine at all. I think this opening of the heart thing is something that many drugs make possible and we just need to give ourselves permission to do it. The great power of MDMA is in uh, what's called directed psychotherapy where a therapist helps you sort out your problems. But we haven't seen, nor are we likely to see, any comparison studies of how well MDMA stacks up against LSD or psilocybin or mescaline. I, I, uh, some therapists have preferred MDMA because they like how it sort of stays on the surface. No titanic hallucinations, no visitations by flying saucers, just an acute awareness of what a schmuck you may have been. <laughs> well, uh, other people uh, want this deep material, want the dreamlike mythological stuff uh, to be brought up. Uh, so uh, that's sort of a matter of fadism. I think that any, dr any drug that you're unfamiliar with may well open your heart. Uh, just in poking around. Opening the heart is an act of attention in a state of unusual psychic dynamics and the unusual psychic dynamics part can be provided by uh, number, numerous uh, substances. How rich in psychedelics are the Caribbean islands, especially Haiti and the Dominican Republic? Uh, there are psychedelic plants in the Caribbean islands. There are the mushrooms, certainly, and there are these anadenanthera trees, the source of the neopo snuffs, and there are deturas. There is also a fairly highly evolved folk medicine in some of those areas. If some of you are ethnobotanists or aspiring ethnobotanists, but you have language difficulty, Think about some of the English-speaking islands of the Caribbean, or think about Belize. Belize is a fascinating cultural area. Uh, the three language groups of Belize are English, Spanish, and Mayan. And it's not at all unusual to meet someone who speaks Mayan and English. And that's what you're looking for, because then your informant, you can actually form a, a real relationship there. So. Uh, in, there are many interesting plants in the New World tropics, including the, the Caribbean islands. Frog? Pardon me? Frog with, uh... Frogs. I don't know about Caribbean frogs, but since you raised this question, uh, they're not frogs, first of all, they're toads. Uh, we don't want the toads to feel left out. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's arisen in the past few years. Some of you may know of it, that these large toads, Bufo alvaris toads, you can capture them out in the American Southwest at a certain time of year and take them back to your four-wheel drive vehicle and, and put pressure on the glands on the back of their neck and get them to squirt out 5-MeO-DMT. Uh, fairly pure, I mean, I, it must be, it looks like it must be 70% the real thing, squirt it onto the windshield of your four-wheel drive vehicle, and then with your frost scraper, after a few hours, you can scrape this stuff up and bag it up and rush back to Berkeley and sell it on the street for <laughs> $80 a gram. Toad foam. It, it's interesting, uh, toad foam is what it's called. 
it, it raises some interesting issues because so far as I know, it's the only animal-based psychedelic to have any availability at all. There are known animal psychedelics. The most spectacular example is a fish off the coast of Norfolk Island in, in, in the South Atlantic where, and this fish contains DMT, and there are other fish with DMT in them. But this toad foam is uh, the first example of an animal-based hallucinogen actually showing up as a product uh, on the underground. Uh, so that... Tree frog from Peru. This is... Pardon me? Is that the Matisse word? Well, this is all Peter Gorman's field work. And uh, I respect Peter Gorman. He's not a personal friend of mine because I haven't spent that much time with him. But he seems to know more about this than anybody else. He's the only white person to have any information firsthand about it. His account is that uh, these extremely uh, uncontacted people in the Amazon have a tree frog which exudes something on its belly and they take a a burning stick and burn a hole into the muscle of the upper arm just like you would take a cigarette and burn a hole into your arm and then they pack this hole with this material from the underbelly of this frog and then a spectacular trip results but um, this is entirely the reports of one field worker, which it's a dream come true for him. This is what we all want to do, is go off and find a powerful hallucinogen that nobody else knows anything about and, and then uh, bring it back. So that's a case of that. Uh, here's a question, not terribly relevant, but I like talking about my friends. Uh, can you talk a little about your association with Rupert Sheldrake? Rupert is a good friend of mine. He and Ralph Abraham and I are writing a book together. He's the morphogenetic field man, and this is an a alternative uh, hypothesis to the scientific hypothesis. Uh, one way of thinking about psychedelics, and I didn't mention it because I didn't want to have to sketch you Sheldrake's cosmology, but since the question was asked, one way of thinking about psychedelics is they amplify the morphogenetic field. We see then what connects whatever you're looking at, whatever you're looking at, then you see what is connected because the morphogenetic field, which is there all the time, but which is sort of mitigated against by our language habits becomes suddenly uh, visible. And then my time wave, which I've strictly avoided talking about today, is an effort on my part to actually write an equation for the Sheldrakean morphogenetic field. And you see, Rupert's idea is not that powerful until somebody can walk to an e a blackboard and write the equations for the morphogenetic field. Until that's done, he's in the position that James Clerk Maxwell was in vis-a-vis -vis the electromagnetic field until somebody then, James Clerk Maxwell in this case, figured out the inverse square law and what the constraints were and then wrote the equations of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, could you elaborate further on the nature of MAO inhibitors? I will, since I mentioned it, and it's worth understanding. It's that... Um, uh, monoamines are these simple chemical compounds that are very active in biological systems, including all the drugs we've been talking about and many drugs we haven't mentioned. These are all monoamines. Well, then you have a, a system in the body called monoamine oxidase, the ACE on the end of a word indicates you're dealing with an enzyme, transcriptase. But this is monoamine oxidase. It's, it oxidizes monoamines. It makes them harmless byproducts. 
So if you take a, a drug, uh, uh, one of these monoamines, it is monoamine oxidase that will render it harmless and shunt it to your urine. But there are what are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And that means that if you take the MIO inhibitor, now the monoamine oxidase can't destroy the monoamine. And the monoamines accumulate and you get high. That's what happens. And, and sometimes monoamine uh, accumulation can be uh, a, a self-generated toxic state where for some reason toxic byproducts aren't breaking down. Then they will give you on monoamine oxidase to oxidize these products away. But it's a reasonable strategy to try and jam the monoamine oxidase machinery to allow an exogenously introduced monoamine to then accumulate to intoxicating levels. So it's just a pharmacological strategy. Where does one obtain high quality cubensis spore prints or cultures? Well, I mentioned my brother and I wrote a book on growing psilocybin mushrooms. You can order it out of the catalogs that are at the front. There's an ad in the back of that book for high quality spore prints and a company called Syzygy will send you a little plate of glass with more spore prints on it than there are people in North America. Are North American uh, cubensis mushrooms, do they have lower potency? And can this be overcome by selective breeding? Selective breeding of mushrooms is an excruciating task. First of all, you have to be able to work with a microscope powerful enough that you can push one spore against another, keeping a third spore out of the picture. Uh, what people call breeding is where you inoculate to a plate two separate strains and where the two growing edges meet, you cut a square out of that and osterize it and then re-inoculate. But that's not really selective breeding. Are North American cubensis mushrooms lower in potency? Yes, they are. Apparently, equatorial heat has something to do with the production of psilocybin. Say something about San Pedro cactus as a psychedelic agent. This is one of the ones that sort of got left out of the survey this morning because I was ripping right along. This is a very large columnar cactus that grows on the northeast coast of Peru and contains mescaline, just like the peyote cactus. And it has been used for a long, long time. We have uh, pottery out of Peru, 3000, uh, third millennium BC of this uh, of this uh, San Pedro cactus. It's a very powerful uh, shamanic agent. Marion Woodman, who I guess spoke to you recently, has stated one of the most noteworthy archetypes to surfaces in recent Analysan's dreams is the Black Madonna, a blending of mother and whore energies. Would you comment on this in the light of your psychedelic experiences and the re-emergent of the feminine energy? Well, I think, uh, you know, the goddess is on the move. Uh, the goddess is, uh, this archetype is drawing energy with a, a fury that has not been seen since the Angevine court of Eleanor of Aquitaine. And, uh, uh, it's a re-imaging of deity that is going on at every level. And uh, certainly on psychedelics, you have immense moving experiences of the goddess. If you invoke the goddess in, in that situation, uh, you can confront her. This is all part of this archaic return. I mean, it's happening on many levels. and. Uh, Imaging the supreme power of the universe as feminine, boundaryless, penetrating, uh, is very important. Let me say just a bit about gender politics, because sometimes people think I have no use for men. Uh, 
when you look at human beings against the background of, of the rest of nature, we are all so yang that the struggle between the masculine and the feminine is not something that should be fought out between the two varieties of human beings. Uh, a proper reconnection to the feminine would be a reconnection to the vegetable matrix. This is the passive, enfolding, caring, uh, bearing matrix of life on the earth. And all animal life comes off as tremendously young, regardless of its uh, sexual expression. So I think we do have work to do on gender relationships between men and women. But more than that, we all have a great deal of re-feminizing to do vis-a-vis -vis the living earth. All righty, right? Does one need a shaman guide in, enter to, in order to enter the world of sacred plants? Is there a danger in working with sacred plants without a shaman? Does one need a shaman guide in order to enter the world of sacred plants? This is the question of the sitter. You know, if you're going to experiment with these things, should you have someone sit with you? I think in the name of prudence, the answer has to be yes, at least the first time. I'm a little uncomfortable giving that advice because I don't like sitters. They hold me at the surface. And they, um, I just, if there's a person around, that's what I end up thinking about. I want to get everybody out of the way so that I can make a very clean, deep plunge to where I'm going and I don't want any witnesses. Because one of the things that happens in psychedelic states is often you're going through something, you're totally ecstatic, but the presentation of it is crisis-like. There you are, you're on the ground, covered with dirt, moaning, screaming, and, and you say, is some, are you all right? Is something wrong? And the answer is, no, nothing's wrong, everything is fine. But the, the person who has the expectations of the culture of what means right and wrong will bring you down with their... And this is why, remember in, uh, in uh, Sin Años de Soledad, uh, when uh, José Arcadia Buendía chained himself to the tree? This is a good technique. I've done this. I've chained myself to a tree so that I would not present a problem to myself. And then I took it with perfect confidence all by myself because I knew I couldn't get away from my tree. Uh, although maybe I could fall out of my tree. Uh, is there a danger in working with sacred plants without a shaman? Well, I suppose the New Age answer is certainly. My answer is... Uh, no less danger than there is working with a shaman, I would say. I mean, you've got to watch these shamans, you know. They're a fairly beady-eyed lot. It, it is the archetype of the trickster. Don't forget that. I mean, the notion that this is just some open-hearted little forest fellow who wants to tell you all his hard-won secrets. I mean, that's a cheerful assumption. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of, of course, you don't want to go too far the other way. I, I always have. I find over and over in the Amazon when I'm off with these people, we come to the place where now we've taken the ayahuasca or whatever it is, and I'm sitting across the fire looking at this guy, and I realize, you know, we're four days up this river and two days down this trail. And, and then I realize with perfect certainty that they're going to kill me. <laughs> right there that evening. This, you have to have a chat with yourself about this kind of thing well ahead of time because you must be able to discipline your hind brain. Your hind brain is always telling you crazy stuff to blow your focus and you just have to say, no, no, he's not going to kill me and even if he tried, I'm bigger than he is. So, you know, and work your way out. But, 
this thing of cross-cultural shamanism, I don't really know what to do with it. I see the shamans, noble souls, brought from the Peruvian jungles and they, they do not do well in these cultures. We don't understand what a corrosive force we are. We don't understand what an air ticket to Paris means to somebody who's never been to the big town at the bottom of the river. And we tend to hold things so close to our chest that we smother them. I think it would be a good idea to leave the shamans in the jungle and if it's so damn important to you to spend time with them, then bite the bullet. Go, go there. Go to them. I mean, what kind of spiritual quest is this where we fly the teacher in <laughs> to a waiting group of uh, psychophants? <clears throat> Uh, how are we doing? Uh, oh, we're not doing so well. That was the last question, folks. Um, well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll smooth the gaff. Uh, by, by saying, uh, this is important, and it may sound like fluff, but it isn't. We look exactly like everybody else to most people. And we will now leave this hall and disappear back into our uh, lives. But you might take a moment. This is your affinity group. It's preposterous, demeaning, and unhealthy to focus on one person. You know, the Terence McKenna, the Tim Leary, the John Lilly. I mean, hell yes, we're great people. But so are you. And this is your affinity group. Someone in this room has what you need. <laughs> Someone in this room appreciates what you've got. So look at each other and pay attention. We are each uh, like a, a virus empowered now to go out in society and spread this new meme this new permission, this new uh, community of awareness of the archaic option. And so I think y you are to be congratulated. You are what makes this all go. If it weren't for you, I would be behind bars. I don't know whether it would be a mental hospital or a state prison, but they'd figure that out later. <laughs> Thanks to you, we have a movement. And this movement uh, offers hope. And I think we need to speak clearly about this hope to people who are not aware of it. An idea has no power unless it is communicated. And we are to some degree in the closet. We are prudent. We don't say we're gutless. We say we're prudent. <laughs> we're prudent. Say, this is no political climate in which to be X, Y, and Z. -ing. But actually, there's no better political climate than the present in which to raise these issues because the rainforests are being destroyed, the native cultures are being destroyed, our authenticity as free-thinking people is being destroyed, all around the issue of the suppression of altered states and freedom to conduct the spiritual quest any way we want. And if we don't raise our voices in protest against this, then without doubt it will be slowly drained away and we will be left in even more of a psychic desert than we already inhabit. So this is the last opportunity. I think that in a hundred years, the earth will be empty. And whether that will be because we are extinct or because we found home is entirely up to us. But our story, the story of the errant monkey, is coming to an end. The final seconds of that story are ticking out. Is it to be followed by no more story or a new chapter, a new story? Well, this has to do with how much integrity, how much self-generated love, and how much intelligence we can bring to bear to the human dilemma 
And these plants, these sacraments, are central to a full exploration and understanding of what it means to be a human being. It's just that simple. Thank you very much. <laughs>